Okay, um, let's get started. Thank you and welcome everybody. I think we'll have a few people coming and going no doubt while I'm doing this opening. So my name is Dan Hill, I'm the Director of Melbourne School of Design, which is the Graduate School here at the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded land this event is taking place. I pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, and the long connection to country and understanding of materials and spaces and environments of places that uh, its peoples so have embodied and stood for for over 65,000 years. Thank you to the conference organizers for inviting me to open this event. It's a huge privilege for us to do so. Congratulations and thank you to the team that's made it happen. Most of you will never know the last minute hitches they had to endure and improvise around in order to make this happen. Um, so congratulations again to them. Thanks so much on behalf of the university for um, pulling this amazing day together. So we've got a great day of discussion thinking ahead. I'm going to run through some of the program in a moment and then say a few words to the conference team before I hand over to Peter and we'll pick things off. Um, the event is hybrid, so some members of the audience are joining us online. Those of you online, hello. And uh, feel free to use the Q&A function in the webinar. You'll be able to submit questions for the panelists there, and those questions will be moderated by the co-conveners. So do use that function if you're online. Otherwise, if you're in the room, then make yourself known as we'll have a discussion. The co-conveners will bring you in. So we'll start, we'll start shortly with uh, this first session. Which will be Angela Rowenfels and Marianne Jackson um, speaking to the theme of the built environment generally, moderated by Peter Raisbeck. Then we've got the early career researcher panel with Shirin Rukari, Imogen Powell, and Benita Takuo, moderated by Dirling Teo Leviana. And we have lunch. And then we've got a third session of housing with Kirsten Day, Neva, and Bizon, moderated by Raylene West. And then we have uh, Michael Walker giving a keynote. And then afternoon tea. And then um, a session on transport to close things out. Jason Thompson, Simon Akbarea, again moderated by I Berlin here. And we'll finish about four. So before we go, Jack, I'd like to um, just say a few themes to the conference agenda here. I'd like to start with uh, a quote from my favorite writers, designers, educators on these themes, uh, Sarah Hendra, who's an artist and design researcher and professor at Olin College. Of engineering in Massachusetts. It's from her book, uh, What Can a Body Do? How We Meet the Built World. And she writes Imagine the envelope being drawn up from the ground, with sides and corners and leaf tops form a shape around a series of habits and patterns for living, a housing for the extent and subtleties of these ways of being. And I love that quote. It's a beautiful quote, I think, because it describes kind of architecture and design. And there's a kind of shroud over these patterns of living, sort of a, a, a flexible carapace um, over behavior itself, over being. She thinks. I borrowed this quote to describe a more inclusive, adaptive, and strategic form of design, really based on deep research and engagement with the realities of things, which one would have to do in order to build those kinds of carapaces or shrouds or envelopes, as Sarah Paul. And that moves well beyond that kind of deep research, the simple functional checkboxes of accessibility standards or the cookie cutter diktats of uh, private sector like built environment most of the time. And it's the focus on these core questions. I mean, she describes ways of being, which is fairly natural. We hear similar in other designers like the Japanese fellow, Sergei Bao Bao, who described design as a balance between usage and planning. We find that we could build an architecture that echoes people's behaviors. Well, let me read out the full quote from Henry, because actually what she wrote, and I edited it as uh, sneakily. Um, imagine the envelope being drawn up from the ground, sides and corners of a rooftop to form a shape and in a series of habits and patterns for living that deaf, keep, deaf people have been doing forever. A housing for the extent levels of these ways of being. So she was writing about the habits and patterns and behaviors of deaf people specifically. And that was about her reflections on working in and with Gallaudet University, the private university for the deaf and hard of hearing students in Washington, DC, which has been leading education in that, in that field since uh, 1864. You can read her book for more on that. But one of our insights about working with Gallaudet was about uh, every single detail of the campus, 
designed around those habits and practice of living again that deaf people have been embodying, exhibiting, pursuing, and acting for uh, forever. She writes about all of the details, including things like the wooden benches, which uh, populate the campus. And they're designed not only to be comfortable and beautiful and functional as wooden benches can be. And of course, wood is a circular design material, which is also handy. But wood, uh, in the words of one of the staff, they said, what is the best material for this kind of group seating due to its resonance and reverberation? And the wooden benches were used as a way of communicating. So students and teachers would just kind of slap the benches. To, uh, to bring attention to the person who's speaking, which is uh, necessary in an environment you have know, a variation of hearing levels. And so the benches are used as a kind of communications device, far more so than, say, if they're made of uh, concrete or a thick plastic, which would tend to absorb the sound, they become almost like a musical instrument. So again, they have this kind of aesthetic quality function, all at the same time, derived from an understanding of what would work in that environment for, for in this case, deaf people. Henson wrote that in this way, deafness produces a distinct, a distinct sensory ecology, which is a phrase I like, you know, what say. distinct sensory ecology, formed by design decisions about what I call them the mundane infrastructures of everyday life, things like wooden benches, actually, or, or doors or seating, or the form of this room. And the deep research and ongoing observation, refining and adaptation over time. Which is not really, as you know, how architecture building planning usually works. We don't often get to refine and adapt and learn in situ professionally, at least with the built into the practice, as many of you know. My own background originally was an interaction designer, designing for tech like the internet or web or smartphones, these things. Um, and in that discipline, accessibility is often to the fore, I would say. It's not as far from perfect. But it's, I'd say it's far more refined than in built environment work in my experience both sectors. I was speaking at the Web Directions Conference in Sydney last week, which is the major one in the, in the South, I guess. Um, and there were numerous sessions on accessibility and designing for accessibility, accessible, universal, or inclusive design folded into the main event itself. It's not a separate conference about it. It's just de rigueur. It's just a pattern of being within that sector, actually. Um, there are separate conferences on accessibility for the web. And the, digital and so on, as you know. But, uh, but this is always in the main conference as well, like core and fundamentals of the practice. And we might wonder why that is from a built environment point of view. Perhaps as a younger discipline, interaction design and service design could shape their practice, discourse and value systems in the contemporary world. I started probably right at the beginning of it, and that was 1994, so as far as it goes back. Um, architecture building and planning, as you know, goes back a lot longer than that. Uh, so we could maybe perhaps fall in some contemporary concerns if we argue accessible design is a contemporary concern. It shouldn't be, but let's just destroy the right balance. And that's been there right from the start. And tech was hardly immune to the uh, so all kinds of issues, as you know. But I'd argue that it's also leaps ahead on this front. When I worked on a project called, um, or I was lucky enough to work on a project in about 2014 called Cities Unlocked, working with Guidebox for the Blind, which is the main uh, charity for visually impaired people in the UK. What I heard frequently from Guidebox for the Blind was the smartphones are the thing that has transformed their world perhaps more than any other thing. The ability to talk to a phone and to have it talk back unlocks a way of working in the world which for visually impaired people was impossible. Some of those things are accidental, perhaps, uh, but some of them are absolutely intentional. If you dig into your phone settings one way or another, you'll find all kinds of accessibility features, again, locked into the core device in a way that often isn't the case, sadly, with built environment, transport systems, um, landscape, the, the things around us in, in our world. So I wanted to overplay it, but we might want to reflect on that sector and how it's been able to do that. We might reflect again that that sector is probably the most valuable in the world. What is magnitude bigger than the built environment sector? Um, and accessibility is the core of those things. And for what it's worth, actually, as a designer, you're far more respected in that sector than environment sector. <laughs> not that that's the most important thing, but it's a designer there is in a position of influence, which is interesting. So, since the launch was highly instructive and impactful for me personally, but more importantly for many, many, many others, it's multi year projects, Guide Dogs for the Blind, uh, Microsoft Research, Transport for London, Network Rail, Tesco Shops. The UK government's agency where I worked at the time was based on making wide wayfinding or 
how you move around for visually impaired people based around headsets and smartphones talking to beacons and faded in the building by bus stops and train stations and things like that. As simple as that, provided the kind of audio based navigation. And if you think about the impact of those kinds of things, um, it's pretty sobering. 180,000 people in the UK rarely leave their house alone, visually impaired people, as the city is rendered inaccessible to them. It's just not designed for visually impaired. Of course, we could extend this to many other types of ability outside of business. This is um, specifically this project. A simple trip to the shops or the library, um, you know, like a 10 minute, 15 minute trip that I would take unthinkingly takes about two hours of planning on average for the visually impaired. The unemployment rate around those with sight loss is around 70%, as opposed to about 7% in the uh, general population. And by 2050, the number of people with visual impairment in the UK doubles to around 4 million people as the population ages. So it's, it's significant compared to these kinds of people. I'd say personally, the most profound insight, again, it's worth, was when I, as part of the project team, had to wear a, a proper blackout mask, which is something that genuinely removes all sight. Um, and then navigate my way across Paddington Station, using only a cane, having never done so before, and I've never been so scared in my life, I think. And that was with someone holding my arm most of the way and guiding me. But uh, you know, a taxi that was 10 meters away suddenly felt like it was 10 centimeters away. It was genuinely confronting. So it changed the way I thought quite fundamentally about cities and piqued an interest um, that I then pursued an inclusive design, which is what I want to pursue here at the Melbourne School of Design, working with my colleagues here. For many people that are in the room. And inclusive design has a far more, has a much wider remit than simple accessibility and construction codes. Um, Zalio and Clarkson State uh, were defined in a recent paper in Building an Environment. Uh, such an academic, I'm quoting academic papers. <laughs> it's called Inclusion, Diversity, Equality, and Accessibility in the Built Environment, a study of architectural design practice, for its worth. Inclusion is not merely a matter of making a design that works well for people with disabilities, but its extended definition also includes understanding how people behave, how they socialize, how they live, how they access the space. Inclusion is formed by and helps to create structures that include large scale social movements. And as a result, it's more at the forefront of minds of designers. They follow this from my paragraph, so I can apply it massively. So it places inclusion in a very, very different context. So the inclusive design opens up this much wider agenda. And it means, as the word inclusion implies, inclusion in the design process, people in the design process. Perhaps me in the long run, other things other than people as well, other living beings beyond humans. And that for me then has echoes of Sherry Armstein's Ladder of Citizen participation from 1969, if some of you know this, which ultimately means full participation is ownership of the thing itself, of the space, adaptation, full ownership in the design process, not as something that's done to you as a consultation at the start of the project, but actual genuine ownership, deep participation. So back to Hendren and talking about Goddard at University, um, she writes that often architects mistake what's going on when she takes them through the campus she writes the idea of deaf space, which is the space that Goladet she's referring to, isn't so much about the features, what design looks like, but instead about the qualities of attention that deaf space practices as its process of design. In that, we find echoes of er earlier kinds of architecture, and I might just quote the words of um, French architect Jean Renaudy, who from the 1960s to the 1980s produced some of the most, to me, anyway, interesting, extraordinary social, actually, literally, uh, uh, socialist housing projects. And the towns around Paris, like uh, Evisa Saint, where he worked with his partner uh, Rene Galustet. And Rene wrote in 1977 redefining architecture as the space and not the structure of human behavior in space, in nature, makes it possible to construct the complex organisms which are the new forms of the town. Architecture is the physical form which envelops people's lives in all the complexity of their relations with their environment. And again, I like that phrase the complexity people's lives in all of the complexity of their relations. So when he's talking about shape there, he doesn't mean so much the simplistic formal qualities of the image used by distance, but again, the idea of this envelope over people's lives. And uh, Renaudy and Gellisbert's drawings um, reveal this, this kind of uh, joyful melange of 1970s textures gone mad. Um, but the sheer complexity of their buildings are extraordinary. Every single apartment is different because every single person is different. And they make that work as a unified whole. 
I'm sure those buildings would fail many contemporary uh, accessibility requirements you know, designed in 1962. Um, but it, the intent of that Hendron's quote on imagining an envelope being drawn up from the ground provides this clue for a more inclusive approach. And it's interesting, both Renaudi and Hendron both use that word envelope. So they both have this imperative for, say, actual design research, which is rarely done in architecture and planning to any depth, um, with a few honorable exceptions, at least compared to other design disciplines. And finding ways of representing, producing true diversity and inclusion beyond the checkbox approach of many accessibility codes, or even the idea of people with disabilities as being uh, so-called edge users. There's an inherent danger with positioning people with disabilities as edge users or lead users. Um, for all the successes I'm sure we all know around good groups, curb cuts and things like that, it, it absolutely separates out people with disabilities. It's a sort of peculiarity to be observed and then generalized for all of the good intentions. Um, it could lead people to disabilities and therefore the integrated possibility of universal access being merely inputs into a larger process, easily in danger of being value engineered out in the proof world of built environment uh, spreadsheets. I've sometimes had it said on projects and indeed in educational context that designing for accessibility somehow impairs the ability to do good or interesting design. Oh. Literally, I've heard those words. I'm sure many of you have as well. Uh, it can't be good design if it's not inclusive. So this is where we need to be, to get to the richness of Hendren's idea of distinct sensory ecologies, in which the primacy of the way things look is submerged into the way that things are, how they happen, what they're about, who made them, the acts of city making. That will have its own aesthetic qualities and formal conditions, but it moves on from what Johanny Pelesma critiqued as architecture and designs of such and with ocular-centric approaches in his book, The Eyes of the Skin. It describes a kind of situated design, set of spatial practices, material cultures, which happens to be the new formulation for architecture studios here at MSD, um, which are quite different to previous ways of thinking about the world. It moves on from planning and policies tendencies as well to float above the reality of places safely insulated in the abstractions of spreadsheets and models, hovering thousands of feet above the richness and complexity of diversity in the street. So we foreground the idea that, again, inclusive design means being included in the design following Einstein's ladder of participation. That means people own the process and the thing itself. In property, this means shared ownership through the cooperative or public approaches or variations on them. Without that, the model of consumption and the cutting this stuff tends to lead to a generalization, again, away from that specificity, that diversity, and true inclusion. Put simply, paying rent in Australia, that means then with no ability or agency to adapt to your environment. You might well be in an apartment designed to check every single box in the accessible housing standards and the national construction code, but it's still not truly accessible or inclusive if you can't adapt and shape your environments around right? your own habits of being, ways of being. So the shift towards understanding and actively engaging with the way that cities are actually used rather than planning or simply made is profound. It means a shift from city making to city using in terms of our focus as a sector. And so policy being something that's informed from prototypes, from practices, from people in place, the realities of things, rather than something done to them. It means a different idea of citizens, a public, a shared environment, or different actions, different verbs. I'll, I'll quote with a, a, a last reference to another way of thinking about this. There's no concept in Arab countries in the Arab world called al mashar which is a variation on the definition of public space. I heard it from the um, kind of Swedish, kind of not. Um, <laughs> Radical Architecture Collective, DAAR, Sandy Halal and Alessandro Petty. And they write in that book there. The Arabic term al mashar refers to communal land equally distributed amongst farmers. Mashar only exists if people decide to cultivate the land together. The moment they stop cultivating it, they lose its possession. So for the category to exist, it must be activated by common uses. So al mashar is different from the public. The state apparatus mediates the existence of the public, whereas al mashar exists beyond this. This public is a space that's given to people by public structures of power, whereas al mashar is a space created by the interaction of people. Public space can exist without people. al mashar only exists when people are constantly producing it. So again, we sense that shift towards al mashar as a space created by the interaction of people, which is individuality. The user centered design, which is a thinly veiled neoliberal position, to instead of focusing on relationships, on agency, and yes, abilities in all of their rich diversity. So, last words is back to Sarah Andrew. 
The granular intimate details that make up the patterns of cultural communication happening outside the normative human sensorium are an invitation to look at what, to look closely at what communities build outside the mainstream, to formalize an often invisible but long held tacit knowledge of the world. Deaf space, she writes, offers a way for architects to keep returning to all the languages of the body. And that, it seems to me, is the possibility here. I hope we dig into this today. To wrestle with the realities of places as they are, of people as they are, to listen to all of the languages of the body, and then work with the very fabric of places and environments and with people as active citizens, not mere consumers or users, and understand what might be in all of its complexity and detail and diversity, to produce what Andrew describes as those distinct sensory ecologies. And that will take a new impetus, a new mission towards a genuinely inclusive form of design. So, with that, I'd like to welcome the participants to this work. Uh, I mean, I hand over to the session moderator, Peter, who is next here, colleague of Melbourne School of Design. And he's going to introduce uh, Angela Rodenfeld and Marianne Jackson. And we will get on with the day. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Dan. And that was a great, closely argued um, speech. And we might try and get a copy of that and put that up on the, on the web. It's my edit. Yeah. <laughs> So welcome everyone. I know that many of you have um, braved our weather to get here today, and we've had a bit of a change to this theatre rather than the other theatre, so you've managed to find us. So that's um, absolutely fantastic. So I think I'll get on with our first um, panel, which if we can have a polling slide, is that possible? That'd be great. Our first panel is focused on the built environment, code standards, and policy. And the panel will outline the interfaces between broad disability policies, building regulations, and standards. And I think for me, the question is, to what degree architects might advocate to shape those interfaces? Can architects and other design experts do much more to understand and advocate for accessible positive standards? And I think some of the things that Dan spoke about, particularly the idea of sensory ecologies as a way of expanding our understanding of the built environment and inclusive issues is really important. So that people with disability have a bigger envelope and their world is not closed in on itself in their, in their minds. So to do that, we will introduce two speakers. And um, firstly, Angela Reinfeld, who is an architect who is specialised in the design of accessible built environments for people of all ages, gauging recognition with a National Disability Award for her achievements. Um, Angela has been, and I think this is really interesting, a long-standing contributor to the, and now chair of the ME-064 Access for People with Disabilities Committee and the Fixtures and Fittings Committee and also the Accessible Housing and um, Fixtures and Fittings and, and, and Wayfinding Committee. So Angela will tell us more about that. Um, and how her work relates to codes and standards. And then, of course, we have the incredible Marianne Jackson, built environment accessibility um, specialist based in the private sector with 30 years of experience. And Marianne's passions revolve around accessibility in the built environment, particularly within the urban realm. But she also has wider professional interests, which include sustainability, accessible reconstruction in post-disaster situations, and of course, equitable housing provision. And we'll be talking about housing in a later panel. Marianne is Managing Director of Visionary Design <laughs> Development, a transdisciplinary consultancy working across accessibility, research and architecture, and her PhD studies are also further investigating ways of assessing the accessibility of the existing built environment with a focus on people 
with lived experience of disability. Now, before I became disabled, I knew of Marianne's work and I thought, right, okay, that was it, right, fine, good. But now that I'm disabled, I realise how important Marianne has been in this particular sector in our city, and I think in many ways she is a superstar. Oh, pleasure. <laughs> so, Thank you so much, Mary Ann. But to begin with, um, Angela, if you want to both come up and then we'll hear what you have to say. And then there'll be time for probably 15 or 20 minutes of questions from you and people watching from home. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Um, I think I can start with saying I joined Dan Hill in acknowledging that today we meet on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. While we're here today to discuss regulations and other means by which we might improve access to the built environment for all people, I note that we might well benefit from considering the kinship of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and contemplate what paying a great respect to all elders might mean for an improved built environment for all. Um, I'd also like to just thank uh, Belinda Seal and Farrah Madden um, as they have allowed me to use um, some of their information and material that they have gained, particularly um, the ability range image that I'm about to show, which was developed by Belinda. So my presentation today consists of my opinions um, and interpretations of information that hasn't been endorsed by any of the um, regulatory bodies um, that I'm discussing. So um, I really, it's really a bit of an overview and a starting point, and I'll encourage you all to you know, take the, the um, information I'm giving you and you know, verify it and further delve into your, yourselves um, in the future. So, um, I've been asked today to give a um, brief overview of codes, there we go, and standards. Um, but as you're aware, regulatory um, reference to codes and standards really only provide, um, are intended to provide um, the minimum requirements for people. And so, I would encourage you all to think more broadly about what you think you can incorporate into your designs um, beyond what the regulators require as minimum, and to look up all available, you know, non-regulatory information and standards and, and publications and articles and research, you know, that, that Dan sort of wove, you know, weaved into his um, his speech. As was mentioned, is the lived experience. That is actually important and it's it's designing for everybody. Um, the tick the box standards are really just minimums. And I think also the point to make is that um, and I'm probably going off my script here now, but um, you know, standards like 1428 part one are really only a generic standard because something has to be put in place. They don't purport to actually meet the requirements of everybody. So again, that's only a minimum standard and there's nothing to stop people, um, you know, designing more inclusive, inclusive spaces. Um, I would uh, mirror what Dan said uh, by saying that, that sadly, um, codes and standards are often used by people, including architects, builders, property owners, uh, in a negative light. The space for accessible elements is often seen as a, you know, constraint in, um, in I guess, in inhibiting creative design or limiting um, preferences for building construction, or I've even heard, you know, wasting potential otherwise income producing floor space. So, you know, it's a very negative starting point, I guess, and, and, and it's very sad that this is how um, these standards are, are viewed. As outlined in the descriptor um, for this session, there is an ever increasing list of requirements with which building designers uh, must comply, including fire safety, project risk, safety and design, climate resistance, and I'm also adding sustainability. 
my view is rather than seeing access standards and codes as an additional pick the box requirement, um, architects and designers should really be looking more broadly um, so that incorporating accessibility features are ticking two boxes at once. So, you know, buildings that are adaptively designed, for instance, also tick the box of sustainability because they mean that there is less wastage, less requirement to rebuild and, and, and I guess, adapt um, buildings when, when people's change needs changes, sorry, when people's needs change. Um, obviously, things like wider corridors and wider doorways will assist in fire safety and egress. So, you know, there are, and, and then the thresholds obviously are much safer for everybody. So, you know, just building these things in, people become, um, I just guess, accustomed to better design um, rather than it just being seen as people who can only access those buildings if these features are in place. If we review the range of abilities on the screen at the moment, um, we will each, I presume, relate to some in which we excel and others where we have limitations. The person sitting next to you will have a different mix of these to you. And I myself need to wear glasses. I can't see the people in the back row at the moment. <laughs> um, and I've also got a slight hearing impairment. So, um, you know, I guess they're my particular needs and I benefit from all sorts of things, larger lettering, all those things that are in the environment as well. And I'm sure many of you do too. So again, it's not just to tick the box for other people other than us, um, you know, to include these things. Um, to meet everyone's needs, our design should not be limited to only providing the building elements that I should say to date um, have been included with, within codes and standards, but should aim to include as many accessible elements as possible <coughs> so the environment enhances our abilities and our confidence in navigating through the built environment. Think about who you're designing for. The answer should be everyone. Don't be afraid to design ahead of the codes and standards, as um, when I get to the Australian standards, you'll be able to see that in fact over time, they've actually improved to be more inclusive. So again, you know, the ideal is that they will keep on improving and including more and more people um, into the future. So. You know, I guess be ahead of the game there. Um, think about you know, every decision you make um, with an overlay of how can I make it closer for everyone, uh, from more generous, you know, certain spaces to better height or contrast, material selections, reverberation levels, which were which were mentioned by Dan. Um, way finding and decision making is obviously a very significant issue um, that has been underrepresented, I would say, in, in standards and codes, um, but again, helps everybody uh, find their way around. And I, I would also try and say, when you work with other disciplines, um, you know, always try and be encouraging to, I guess, move away from the mental segregation that I believe occurs where people consider these elements are in buildings for other people. Um, I guess this is what we're about at Ableist um, Inclusive Day, but it's also about how we, I guess, discuss these things with other disciplines that may well want to put codes and standards and minimum accessibility into a separate box as well. So next slide, please. Um, so I'm, I wasn't quite sure what the audience was going to be, whether we were going to have undergraduates or more educated people. So I might just try and skip over some of these things. Um, but just, I guess, to reiterate, you know, the regulatory framework in Australia um, includes, is mostly still focused around physical accessibility. And obviously this is a practical requirement due to the, you know, expense of um, post-adaptation, but also the reality that if physical accessibility uh, isn't included in a building, it precludes people from entering the building and participating in, in whatever is, is going on. So, um, you know, it doesn't diminish, I guess, the requirements of people with hearing impairment or vision impairment, the more they need um, um, specific building inclusions uh, for them to be able to participate as well. Uh, but there has been, I guess, a worldwide focus on more physical uh, regulatory requirements. 
So, um, so the, yes, I, I just want to just quickly go through um, what we've got up here today. Um, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Disability Discrimination Act, the National Construction Code, various Australian standards and local building, local government regulations. Um, I won't actually discuss in detail local government regulations, um, but they're obviously important in relation to achieving planning permits um, and other local based laws. And I also note that a number of planning authorities um, around Australia are now requiring compliance with some little and little housing um, Australia guidelines as well, which I will touch on a bit later. So, slide. Uh, as you're all um, aware, Australia is a signatory to the UN Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, I've been interested that as part of my work on the International Standards Association, many um, decisions and discussions, people come back to saying, how does that fit um, with the convention? Um, and it has struck me that I'm not aware as those sort of, uh, that those sort of conversations are so frequently raised in Australia. And I, and I think we should be, you know, referencing back to that a lot more in the way we think about things. Um, I've just put this up uh, on the screen because I think it, it does succinctly identify, I guess, what we're trying to address. You know, um, it's in the preamble, it says disability results from the interaction between persons with impairments and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinders their full effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. So, I mean, again, it's getting back to that ableist diagram, you know, to some degree, um, you know, that, that encompasses all of us as well. So I'd all encourage you to reread that document if you haven't or read it if you haven't actually read it before. Um, the next um, item is the Disability Discrimination Act. Um, you know, the, the Act makes it unlawful to discriminate against a person with a disability. The DDA contains a broad definition of disability, which includes physical, intellectual, psychiatric, sensory, neurological, and learning impairments, as well as physical disfigurement and the presence of a body of disease causing organisms. Disability standards include access to premises, buildings, education and training, and public transport. Um, I'll just really talk about the access to premises buildings today, but obviously there are others that you can go on and look at. They're all up on the web, so um, yes, they're, they're readily available. The publication of the Disability Access to Standards premises um, in 2010 and updated actually in 2020 um, addressed previous concerns related to how buildings could be built that would meet the minimum requirements of people with disabilities to satisfy the requirements of the Disability Discrimination Act. An agreement was made that the minimum requirements published in the Disability Access to Premises um, would also be incorporated into the now uh, National Instruction Code and within selected Australian standards. This alignment was welcomed by many parties as it provides some level of certainty. However, um, compliance with the NCC requirements do not necessarily result in meeting the requirements of the premises standards. Um, as the NCC only covers items which uh, are required for a building permit, um, so both documents should be reviewed uh, when designing, building and operating premises. As an example, um, items such as some finishes and fit out, which do not require a building permit, um, are not included with the NCC, but are covered by the DBA. It's also worth noting um, that this clarity and alignment has not eliminated discrimination um, cases involving buildings. Many of you are probably aware of the recent complaint in 2021 uh, between Ryan versus the Sunshine Hospital and Health Service in Queensland, uh, which involved an applicant who used a wheelchair for mobility and who had a vision impairment. He claimed that some elements of the design and construction of the Sunshine Coast University Hospital, in particular the wayfinding signage and some finishes, discriminated against him. The judgment found in his favour and a rectification order was made, and this is still ongoing. 
um, but actually has been a bit of an interesting topic between some architects and their insurers. Um, so just raising that to uh, alert you to these, these ongoing things. So the next one. Um, so uh, I noted in the in the preamble that I was asked to talk about the the prospective um, inclusion of some of the livable housing um, guidelines within the NCC. Um, so I'll just quickly run through um, what's in there. So obviously the NCC referenced some Australian standards, um, but I won't be specifically discussing that content today, but I will just run through quickly um, the NCC information. So the most recent update of the NCC includes information relating to its own proposed ABCB standard for animals uh, for incorporation with class two, so apartments and class uh, 1A dwellings, so that's houses. Lobbying for incorporation of accessibility to dwellings has been ongoing for many years. Um, and many of us know that uh, some overseas countries have had um, accessibility requirements in their building codes for probably at least a decade, if not longer. So Australia was really lagging behind including something here. Um, the current list of requirements were based on some of the silver level elements within the livable housing point guidelines which has been a voluntary publication since its inception. The intent of the inclusion of these items within the NCC was to ensure that apartments and dwellings were designed to meet the needs of community, including older people and those with mobility-related impairments. It could be considered that the NDIS prompted government to move the standards in general housing. The functional intent is that the sole occupants of your dwellings would be easy to enter, easy to navigate and around, capable of easy and cost effective adaptation and responsive to the needs of occupants. In line with the intent of the NCC, the proposed incorporated elements are identified as minimum necessary provisions rather than exemplar of best practice. Um, and I also note that the ABCB is intended to um, publish some of the gold level requirements, um, which can be applied on a voluntary basis. At the moment, um, the so at, at the moment this is all um, on hold, uh, and it's actually being reviewed again um, by a group called the Little House Implementation Advisory Group. So for updates on the um, I'll move the ABCB website. Um, are we interested in a bit more detail on these or are we happy that that's topics at the time? Yeah, so I mean I'll do a just just one question. Quick overview, but um, it, it's about you know step free access. Um, you know, yeah. with the doors in the late 20 to certain areas um, and access through through the accommodation to um, key, key spaces such as um, sanitary compartment, garage, those sort of things. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the only final thing, just I guess maybe some of you or most of you might know that whilst uh, whatever is ultimately adopted here uh, into the NCC still needs to be um, is adopted in each state and territory. Um, and as of now, as I understand it, New South Wales and WA have decided not to adopt um, the housing. So it will be interesting to watch that progress um, when the guidelines are finalised. So, yep. um, my only other comment on this is that if you are all involved in designing accessible or adaptable housing, um, there are other, other guidelines and documents that you can look at, obviously, ones such as the Liverpool Housing Design Guidelines, the Gold and Platinum Standards there provide a higher level of accessibility for silver, um, the NDIS Specialist Disability Accommodation Design um, Standard, again, provides more detailed information, and also the Adaptable Housing Standard, AS4299, um, which is an old standard. Um, there has been ongoing discussion about updating it, um, but there is still a lot of information in there that is, is useful to designing 
adaptable housing. So I guess that the benefit of adaptability means that it, it can be incorporated at the start and then customised when um, individuals' specific requirements are known rather than, uh, I guess, more standardised dimensions where, they, where there's a reliance on you know, particular body shape or type. Um, Australian standards, yep. Okay. Um, I represent the AE at the Institute of Architects on the um, M64 committee, and as um, Peter said, I'm the current chair of those standards. We're responsible for writing all of the um, access standards, um, and we also cover 4299 as well. Um, just to give you a quick overview of Australian standards, it's uh, a voluntary committee, um, organisations such as the Institute of Architects, the MBA and others, uh, nominate a uh, representative onto that committee. Uh, we all then um, basically collaborate to, to write the standards. Standards are initiated by anyone can initiate um, a standard if they believe uh, it's of value to the community. It doesn't have to be a standard that is intended for referencing by a regulatory body, um, but there has to be a demand and need for the information in the standard and I guess an argument to say that it should be consistent across the community. Um, we, uh, yeah, so again, standards in their own right um, aren't a legal requirement. They only, um, I guess, become in force once they're referenced by a regulatory body. So an example of this is the 1428 Part 1 um, 2020 standard, uh, sorry, 2021 standard, um, while people can use it um, at the moment until it's actually been referenced and is in place when we, uh, called up by the NCC or others, uh, it is not the content is not required to be used or legally, legally required to be used. Um, the only other thing to note related to that is that um, there can be a number of um, standards with the same name with different publication years. So uh, regulatory bodies um, call up the actual year of publication. Um, the reason why we end up with a number of standards with different years still um, available as opposed to superseded relates to whether or not there's an active reference to them um, in, in, in some form of regulatory requirements. Um, Angela, we've, we've just run out of time. Out of yeah. time. I, 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 so, all right, that's fine. A uh, <laughs> couple of points then to this top one here. This is really just to illustrate, uh, I guess my next point was trying to direct you all to the supplement. Um, if you're wanting to understand why things are like they are, we can't actually put notes in the standards. Um, but the supplement gives you a lot of the background as to why, and this diagram comes out of the supplement. You know, often there are comments about why those um, accessible bathrooms are so large, and if you have a look at the number of renewables that maybe someone might need, you can see why that much space is required, and also why it's not a good idea to be using it as a storage room for your fair mm. years. <laughs> you know. Um, so... The, um, we'll just, just skip to the last slide and I'll just quickly. Oh, that was, sorry, no, all right. Um, just a couple of other things international standards, in, um, EN standards, and uh, British standards. Overseas, more money for research. They're able to produce. Um, uh, standards on other topics that we haven't yet been able to get to. So, if you're interested in looking at what else is out there, if we have got, if we don't have anything, then, or if you're looking for other interesting information, please look to those um, standards as well. Um, the BSI have just uh, published one called Design for the Mind Neurodiversity in the Built Environment, um, which is a new addition to the group. Um, and I, and I know that you've probably all seen the universal design standards, but I still think, you know, they are applicable to how we think about how we design spaces. 
you know, if we put that sort of uh, filter of, you know, equitable use, flexibility in use, simple and intuitive use, all of these things that are up here on that slide, we will we will end up designing better better environments. So thank you. Sorry to. No, no, no. I've had two. Not chairs, but it's not as tough as me. Um, Mary Ann. Yeah, no pressure, Peter. So, acknowledgement of punky is given. Um, so, thank you, Angela, for that entree into aspects of the world of rules, environment, accessibility codes, and standards. Everybody that knows me knows that I'm also deeply interested in built environment accessibility. On and off over the last couple of decades, I have spent um, time mapping the legislation policy landscape across the built environment, disability and cities at international, national, state and local levels. And I must say, I find it endlessly fascinating. <laughs> so, so as you all now know, I'm Mary Ann Jackson. In the interest of enhancing inclusion for those unable to see me, I'm of Anglo-Saxon ancestry in my early 60s and have wavy, strawberry blonde, shoulder length hair. I wear dark tortoise shell square strained glasses. And today I'm wearing blue shirt, off-white trousers and black sandals. I only make my trousers and shoes because a couple of weeks ago, the profoundly vision impaired MC at an event, after listening to various descriptions of people's per personal descriptions, Inquired, is anyone in the room actually wearing pants and shoes? <laughs> um, so, do we have captions for this event at all? We obviously don't have Auslan, and that's a problem with a lot of events these days. No, I think so. Yeah, there's all this captioning. Um, um, if anyone with hearing impairment wants um, captions, but I'll try to speak as clearly as I can. So, Besides being an architect, urban planner, and access consultant, as you've already heard, I'm the director of visionary design development, private sector for purpose transdisciplinary consulting, working at the intersection of built environment and disability. Visionary design development resulted from the merging of my architecture practice and my late husband's optometry practice, as you do. And so I was also a carer for my husband, and I'm currently doing a PhD around neighborhood accessibility. Although event material has listed built environment, codes, standards, and policy as the topic of this panel, my presentation today is entitled Entourages of Caring, Working Together With. Some of you may have already read the abstract provided on the website created for today's symposium. As noted, I'm currently undertaking a PhD. The more practical aspect of my PhD field work is investigating the accessibility, although unfortunately inaccessibility is probably more accurate, of the existing built environment, neighbourhood scale, neighbourhoods being obvious components of cities. But in tandem with the practical, the more theoretical abstract side of PhD is concerned with how to design in positive change in complex adaptive systems. Hence, in this presentation, I'm going to touch on five interrelated topics. These are entourage of care, complex adaptive systems, legislation and policy, applied research, and ethnographic research. I would also like to note that at this stage, that having no graphics accompanying this presentation is intentional. Both our own visual design development work and research with Melbourne University personnel during the last couple of years have started to really highlight the reliance of the built environment domain, particularly the architectural profession, on graphical representation. While graphic heavy presentation is completely necessary in many contexts, working drawings spring to mind, conventional architectural communication, both documentation and language, is often exclusionary and I, albeit generally unintentionally ableist. Dr. Kirsten Day, We'll also be speaking more on this this afternoon when she talks about the most recent thesis design studio she and Dr Andrew Martell have led this semester just gone. Returning more directly to my presentation and thinking about one of the foundational questions posed for this symposium, that is, 
Are our cities still fundamentally ableist in not yet having provided universal accessibility? And as extracted from the preamble to this panel session, can architects and other design experts do more to understand rather than simply comply? So let's first consider the entourage of care. Although dictionaries and common usage generally interprets entourage as the group of people who travel with and work for an important or famous person, I'm asking you to consider a broader notion of entourage, more akin to support. And obviously the important person at the center of this support system is a person with disability or disabled person, identity being a personal preference. So following on from the Virtual Disability Conference 2022, Raising Expectations, which amongst other wide ranging topics discuss disabled bodies in spatial environments, I want to briefly reflect on what enables disabled bodies to be in built space. Everyone wishes to go to stay in or go out as they want, when they want. Nonetheless, many people with disability need assistance. For example, workers, carers, family members, and or assistance, for example, hoists, equipment, and or hygiene products, condoms, pads, to enable personal care. All this broadly classified as support for no requires space. Many people with disability need support to mobilize. Support may include human and or animal assistance, and or mobility or equipment aids. Blind and or vision impaired people may opt for using a cane rather than taking their guide dog in certain situations. People with restricted physical mobility often use different mobilities, mobility aids when in than when out. For instance, crutches might be used at home while the power chair is used in the community. Motorized mobility aids need charging. For various reasons, ranging from age-related lack of strength to other needs, many wheelchair users will have a support worker or workers with them. Many people with disability and or chronic illness and or elderly people cannot walk very far, needing to frequently pause and sit. Many people have difficulty with heat or sun or cold or rain. Um, so lack of shelter is therefore problematic. And the effect of rain on footpath surfaces and badly installed curb cuts is a whole nother story. Adult change rooms and or changing place toilets are functionally specific. They are not merely a bigger version of an accessible toilet. Deaf people using sign language need face-to-face -face space to communicate and deaf blind people reliant on touch and or braille for navigation need to be able to find the appropriate signage. And as Dan said earlier, using mobile phones as a mobility aid navigation device is now ubiquitous. Mobile phones and Wi-Fi are also fast becoming integral components of hearing assistance. Mobile phones need both visible and invisible infrastructure, as do Wi-Fi enabled beacons for people with vision impairment and digital information on screens for people with hearing impairment. Social inclusion is essential to the human well-being. However, built environment design often fails to account for the necessary entourage of care. That is, enabling social inclusion has far-reaching spatial and systemic implications. So borne out by my extensive professional experience and research, such implications cannot be adequately addressed by compliance with, for example, the premises standards. More factors are obviously involved. So moving on to complex adaptive systems. As inferred by the previous topic, many sub subsystems, system subsystems, are simultaneously in play for bodies with or without disability to be or not be in built space. And as such, subsystems may be, and such subsystems may be simultaneously nested and or interacting and or overlapping and or reshaping. Subsystems can be both visible, an obvious example being the buildings in a neighbourhood, and invisible, or at least not have a physical form, such as legislation and policy. And additionally, many subsystems are siloed, often when they shouldn't be. Therefore, any socio-ecological system 
involving bodies plus built environment is necessarily complex. As espoused by the social model disability, disability is not a pre existing independent condition. In distinguishing between impairment and disability, the social model deems disability to be socially constructed. Disability is not ascribed to an individual's impairment, but rather results from the interaction between body and environment. Consequently, the built environment can be and often is a disabled instrument in itself. So, better infrastructure is required for impaired bodies to be less disabled by the environment. Infrastructure is therefore both a subsystem and an actor with agency. Agency, however, cannot exist in a vacuum. Relationships between actors are also subsystems and, which, and systems that cannot be physically seen, but are part of the bigger system and so on. Nonetheless, given all the above, please remember built environment is not self propagating, but all built environment is people instigated. Therefore, the built environment is inherently a system capable of being adapted, and although complex, being adapted means it can be changed for good. But how does one design in positive change in complex adaptive systems? Perhaps the invisible subsystem legislation and policy, ostensibly the topic of this panel, is the answer. Most architects and building designers are only familiar with the accessibility requirements contained in the Building Code of Australia, not the broader system or the actual content of underpinning legislation, such as the Disability Discrimination Act and its accompanying disability standards, public transport education premises standards. Most architects are definitely not familiar with the UNC CRPD, or, which is more usually known by that acronym, and or disability legislation policy, such as Australia's disability strategy, or inclusive Victoria, which is Victoria's state disability plan, and local government disability action plans, all the concept of disability inclusion advisory committees. The built environment domain doesn't tend to have those sorts of um, committees, relying more on the hard infrastructure of codified requirements rather than the soft infrastructure of personal narratives. Compliance is therefore usually based on the evaluation of a static plan of something not yet built. The dynamic movement through existing space and the built environment and built environment use is what it happens in reality. Surely if more attention was paid to what happens in reality, the installation of TGSIs, tactile ground service indicators, both warning the bubble ones and directional, the rectangular ones, would be minimised. Although there is no dispute, that TGSIs are useful for people with vision impairment if appropriately installed. They are often annoying to wheelchair users and high heel shoe wearers, as well as being a slip and tri trip hazard for everyone when wet and or not properly maintained. The latter is so common. When one walks or wheels around any neighbourhood throughout Melbourne, there are so many examples of broken, missing, lifting TGSI installations. So please do not take the preceding TGSI rant to mean that I think TGSIs should <laughs> never be installed, but it is good to highlight that the compliance is only a small part of a very bigger story. So applied research. My commentary under this heading is going to be pretty short and sweet. Architects, building designers, all built environment practitioners must get out and about more investigating actual existing conditions. How do you take measure? For example, how high is that step? How wide is that doorway? Observe, for example, how does one get to that seat? Why is that signalised intersection button behind that big pole? Think about, for example, the raised roadways at intersections suit all users. This compliance the answer. Compliance with what exactly? So the preceding are just small snippets of suggestions regarding what there is to see when one gets out and about in the neighbourhood. Although other disciplines might use other terms, for example, baseline mapping, the early stages of change projects, the necessity to document existing conditions is something that all projects of change have in common. 
Even with the wonders of modern technology, one cannot fully understand the existing conditions of a neighbourhood's built environment, sitting in an office on a chair in front of a computer. So moving on to my last topic, ethnographic research. As my current fieldwork tests, combining existing conditions research and ethnographic research, that is getting out and about in the neighbourhood with diverse people with disability is immeasurably beneficial. I'm very happy to talk more about my current fieldwork later, but it's probably time for me to wrap up now. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that architects must stop leaping to building something as the answer, even if that something is compliant with the code. Interaction with people with disability is key. To better understand lived experience of existing built environment in accessibility, architects in practice and academia must first and foremost, crucially, just hang out with people with disability. Interaction leads to meaningful engagement, leads to motivation to act, leads to working together with a crucial ingredient of designing in a positive change. This is difficult because the system, currently at least, structurally separates the disability domain and the built environment domain, which is a, which is the discussion of this day. Thank you so much, Marianne. Now I think we've got time for some questions before Jasmine comes in. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah. So thank you. In the very point, I always see this example accent for is really important for doing design. Uh, I want to ask you one question. At the moment, if we follow the you know, building standard, Australia called the building standard, uh, design the house, all right? For example, behind the door, the door is the 820 under the uh, under the standard. But today is after I sold the house, uh, some disassemble by the house. Today uh, can access or uh, this standard too small because uh, we designed for disassemble uh, access. I remember in the time hundred, you know, this is important. This is I think in the long time because I sell the house. December, you know, the family of a December to buy that. You then can, you know, or they come to the renewing the law. Thank you. A prosaic question, but mm -hmm. one that I think has implications. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it is, and you, you've actually got, I guess, right to the heart of the conversation between minimum and yeah. and other. Um, I guess in answering that, um, when you look at, I'll use the Liverpool Housing um, Australia guidelines as an example to answer that question, although there are other documents. You know, this is where the silver, gold, platinum, um, standards come because obviously the higher up the, the ladder you go, the more accessible it is. And I guess this has always been my personal concern about um, how some of these guidelines um, that and many other organisations have all have developed their own guidelines um, in the last sort of 20 years. You know, I guess it's around that public education and perception. Now the the, you know, the, the NCC are calling them livable and, and livable, as we all know, doesn't actually necessarily relate to accessible <laughs> uh, and certainly not accessible for all. And, and I guess that is part of the challenge, you know, that, that really in, in incorporating some requirements into the NCC, um, I guess there must be some education process that's going to go with that because it, I think the probably the answer to your question is, you know, it would depend who was going to buy your house and who was going to move in um, as, to, as to whether it was going to be suitable for them or not. That is, is the answer, yeah. Mary Ann, do you want to say to that? Um, it's problematic 
And this is something that I've been very interested in the whole time, is the state of existing housing. But basically in Australia at the moment, our existing housing is not fit for purpose. Right. <laughs> can, can I just add another comment, though? When you look at some of the overseas examples, they are also quite minimal. Um, you know, so, you know, in the past, there's been a lot of conversation about visitable, which isn't sort of currently being discussed in relation to, um, uh, you know, what's proposed in the NCC, but that must be one of the significant driving forces so that, um, so it, there's a, the difference between independently um, accessible and, and whether you can have your parent or your friend or someone to come into your dwelling. Yeah, thank you. You didn't raise a question online. You want me to do that? We better take the online one. Okay. Yeah. So the question is um, I think this is directed to Angela, but of course, Mary Cadastro as well. So it took uh, around 20 years to get livable housing standards into the NCC, but governments and industry are still arguing it's about time due to economic reasons. Um, however, do we risk undermining fundamental human rights by focusing on the economic? argument um is it a matter of advocating both sides of the coin human rights and economic benefits or must we prioritize one over the other it's from alex master of architecture student um and also working at the department of transport and movies in queensland okay. um i don't think it's an either or I, I, I think it's a very complex you know to, to put together the if any of you have read in detail the RIS process um, that, that the ABCB have to go through before anything's installed, uh, you know, implemented. Um, and this has been the ongoing conversation about, you know, how, how do you value um, access? It's, it's actually, it, it's, it's, it's not easy to, to value in dollar terms necessarily. Um, you know, how can you predict how many extra people are going to come into your shop if you, you know, make it more accessible? Um, so there are many layers of, I mean, obviously more people would, <laughs> and obviously I guess in the public interest and in, in, in just society, it, it's better to provide accessibility. And I suppose, you know, that's been part of the conversation um, around, you know, society benefit versus Dollars. And, and I, I might want to, I'll just tell you a quick anecdote that I looked at some information in the UK when they introduced, um, they have an organisation called the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, and they do a lot of building of housing. They just quietly implemented uh, many years ago things like level thresholds, wider corridors. And then they went back 12 months after people had moved in, not knowing that these were particularly accessible features. Before they put them in, there were lots of arguments about we don't need them and, you know, it's unnecessary. One of the key things out of the research was when they went to in interview the people afterwards, they didn't even notice them. They accepted all the benefits of how easy it was to move their furniture in, put their prams in, whatever. It wasn't an issue. And so I guess that's the, the problem about segregating requirements separate from just good design and good building practices, that if it wasn't highlighted, people would see all the benefits. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I think we've got one more yeah. question here. I'll just add on to that. Great access is almost invisible. You only see it if you yeah. don't have that. It's just a, a barrier to all sorts of participation. Um, I am not want to go. I see. I've got a question around we are talking about standards and codes. Um, and all the kind of space community space I'm not just on. I wanted to know um, earlier this year or potentially last year, ISO released um, standards on accessible tourism. Now I'm wondering, does that conflict or contrast with any Australian standards? Do you know of any examples that have uh, any groups that have used that standards? Yeah, so just uh, what I didn't, what part of what I didn't get to say was, so ISO standards are separate. Australia, Standards Australia has an agreement with ISO um, and, and the agreement is that if an ISO standard is appropriate for Australia, 
um, it will be considered by the Australian Com uh, Committee for Adoption. And one of those examples is lifts, for instance, that um, you know, some of the ISO standards have been adopted here. Um, we don't have an standard on accessible tourism. We do have Simon Darcy, who um, I believe um, is a member of that ISO standard or has, you know, is now on that committee. Um, ISO standards, um, people shouldn't, I guess, assume because they're international that they're necessarily better than what we've got here because local standards are based on our population, our requirements, things that are applicable to us. Um, not to say some of the ISO standards aren't applicable to us, but the accessibility standard, for instance, um, has had input from many, many countries who have, you know, people of um, different size, they have different governmental decisions around what percentage of the population they believe is appropriate to be entering buildings, and that, of course, relates to dimensional requirements. They have different economic requirements. Um, so um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is uh, Simon has written some articles, I think, a while ago, Australian-based accessible tourism. But, yes, certainly, you know, we don't have anything um, here in a standards perspective. So, yes, that would be Right. <laughs> <laughs> Went to see so many questions, but I'm worried Jasmine and Burley are going to have a few more. Yeah. 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 Bradley? Um, thank you. Very, very excellent presentation. Thank you for highlighting issues. Um, I guess, you know, we talk about the Disability Discrimination Act came in 1992. Standards process didn't get through in 2010. Like we talk in disability world about progressive realisation of rights um, and how long it's going to take us in the country to improve our accessibility. You know, I think the standards and the, the model that we have used the standards on every country, you know, is set on that framework to link the DEA with standards, but we have it. I guess, you know, we're now 12 years down that pathway. I think it's done a good job in terms of accessibility for new buildings and getting them on board and getting level entry in and getting bathrooms and, and getting disability access in. But I think, you know, the real gap is the existing buildings. And, you know, the, the standards are just too weak to, you know, create this change quick enough. And as you mentioned in your talk, you know, unless something comes under a building permit and just gets, you know, a shop does a fit out and the, the steps don't get removed and they don't create access. So I'm just wondering if you can just talk to the, you know, the, I guess the broad function of the standards in creating accessibility in the built environment and that particular issue around existing buildings. Um, Marianne, do you want to speak to that one? Yeah. Well, as Raylene knows, I mean, it's been a fascination of mine ever since I got involved in this arena, the state of the existing built environment. And in so many ways, the, the whatever standards, legislation is in place doesn't directly address that. Um, and that's why um, my position, at, which has developed over time, is that we need to all get out and see what the existing conditions actually are. Because, you know, in Australia, apathy is kind of the national pastime. You know, mm -hmm. most things are pretty good. We see tactile ground in, um, surface indicators. We see curb cuts. We think, oh yeah, it's fine. You know, we know that we've got standards, fine. We've got, we've got disability access covered. But if you actually get out there and out and about in the neighbourhood, you so <laughs> discover that the existing conditions are problematic. And so we need to have more functions like this. We need to have more interaction in the domains between the disability domain and the built environment domain. We, we just need to interact more with people and I, I think, Raylene, um, you know, retrofitting or keeping our existing building stock is becoming more and more important because of sustainability issues and embodied carbon. We can no longer afford, really, to pull buildings down and rebuild them. Yeah, so... I think Absolutely, that, and that's yeah. another reason why you have to get out with people with disability to understand what their lived experience is because it may not be necessary to leap to doing something that the standard might suggest you should do. 
Sorry. Yep. Uh, my name is Shalara. I'm with the Basic Dining I'm a uh, vision impaired and got a blind job with me. Um, this cuts across everything that we're talking about here. One of the things that doesn't get discussed in any of the neighbourability accessibility is access to grass for a service animal. And we've got more than my these days. So in, say, the CBD of Melbourne or the CBD of Sydney, I'm staying in either location, there's probably two or three motels, hotels that I can stay at, which are normally the five-star ones. So I'm paying probably double what anyone else has to pay so that I can actually access grass that's not 10 blocks away. Um, so when we're building um, these hotels or even restricts employment, so there are certain universities that I wouldn't work at because I can't get to grass. So it's even looking at that access. Why are we not putting, it's not in the standards anyway, um, why are we not building into our neighbourhoods, into our buildings, into our tourism, toileting spaces for animals? We've just got the most brilliant toileting space at Virgin Domestic Airport here in Melbourne, which is just so bloody good, it's not funny. Um, so I just wanted to raise that, because that doesn't come up in the conversation. Absolutely. I mean, and that's the sort of... In work that I'm going to get into that this is what is uncovered when you actually get out and about in the neighbourhood with diverse people with disability because you start finding these things out. Um, with my site sessions that I'm doing for my PhD, yes, my last site session, the first thing we had to do was um, the blind participant had his dog guide with him that day and he wanted to find a space because he wasn't sure that where the he didn't want to have accidents later. Yeah. And so, yes, I said, oh, yeah, okay, there's a street tree. I forgot to think about the overhanging branches. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't a big problem, but he almost, you know, hit his head on the tree while attending to his dog. <laughs> that, I think, is an amazing and revelatory point for those of us who are interested in urban design because it's not something we no. would normally think about, the relationship of... And I've just been away at a hotel and got to get a ranch trying to find a place for my service dog to go and take. Yeah. So I've got a good old one room site at the moment. Right. <laughs> so I, I think we're going to have, I'm sorry, we're going to have to cap it there because um, we're running 10 minutes over already. So <laughs> thank you so much, Angela and Marianne. And thank you, everyone, for your questions, particularly that last one you talked about. Right. And um, we will move on to the which is our esteemed um, early career researchers that organized a panel. I'm not quite sure what they're doing, so it's a little bit of a surprise to me. And I think, um, Dooley, you will be moderating. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning. So we're now in our second session. So I'm honored to welcome our three early career researcher uh, panelists, and uh, they will be talking about their research. So um, on important questions affecting disability in built environments, such as um, addressing questions such as what does national justice or justice look like for people with disabilities, what counters can fight special injustice, and how can we create spaces that promote equity, access, and justice. So we will be listening to three research projects, um, exploring the livability of the space for visually impaired people. We have Shireen, um, who will be speaking um, about it. Then we will have Imogen, how, uh, speaking about designing workplace inclusion. And then Punita here beside me will be talking about pursuit of happiness for power wheelchair, wheelchair mobility device users in urban public spaces. So to introduce, uh, introduce Shireen, um, Shireen holds a bachelor's degree in architecture and has completed her master's in urban design. She is currently pursuing her PhD research at the Melbourne School of Design, uh, focusing on understanding the livability of urban spaces for vision impaired people or VIP and their interactions within public spaces. So on to you, Shireen. Yes. Uh, hi everyone. Just be saying, yeah, it just helps with the Thank you. Uh, 
I'm just going to give you an overview about my PhD uh, research, which is mainly focusing on availability of urban space for visual impaired people who have called them VIPs in my research because they are very important people in the urban as well. And my case study is Central Melbourne. Uh, cities are designed for people, and there should be a balance between people's uh, needs and expectations. And it should be the aim of uh, urbanists to design and develop high quality environments, which are actually included <laughs> and inclusive for all and people, including individual members. So, the aim of my research is to explore and analyze the uh, urban livability for visual impaired people. And my main research question is how can the only detail of an urban space be defined based on the ideas, experiences, and perceptions in urban spaces? Just give you a very brief demographic information about visual impaired people. There are around 153 million VIPs around the world. And uh, currently, in Victoria, uh, we have around uh, 100,000, which is uh, roughly like 1.5 of the uh, percent of the population. Uh, when we think about livability, our mind might shift to the uh, livability recognition is our quality of life uh, systems that um, are not really inclusive for uh, all people. And then you look at their agendas, they have their own agendas, and they don't particularly think about their mistakes or even with their people. So, my research is based, uh, based on the academic literature on uh, the degree of urban spaces. And then we look at the uh, definition of uh, livability. Actually, there is no uh, one definition for that. But then we look at the livable city. It's a uh, city just safe, legible, accessible, enjoyable, comfortable, and uh, even vital. Uh, and as I can say, in other words, it's an umbrella term for different criteria. And I'm going to be thinking uh, for those looking at what's going on in the literature for visual impairment and cities. Uh, there are some particular criteria, like a safe, barrier-free, accessible, and uh, not necessarily environment. And there is also a thick body of the literature for uh, refining issues. So the, the, I mean, the comprehensive way of looking at is that quality of learning is based, it's not based on one criteria, but also mobility uh, in criteria, social criteria, physical criteria, and Psychological criteria are all and also important. And the definition of VIP is in my research. Uh, in my research, VIPs they are not people just only trying to find their way in the city. They are spatial, they are multidimensional, and uh, they actually they experience a different way of uh, urban spaces. So uh, biopsychosocial model uh, is actually my point of uh, focus uh, on my research. Methodology. Um, well, uh, our methodology has like seven, it uh, contains seven sections. Um, that, well, uh, I them all the students when we uh, start our PhDs. Um, we have, uh, we go through the literature to have uh, this theoretical sensibility. Uh, I'm <laughs> Okay. Uh, I also interviewed uh, visual and urban designers in the city of London. I interviewed visual care people. I interviewed some experts in the field who are actually dealing with the issues of visually impaired people in the city. I uh, had uh, audio uh, diary recording, I had word game, I had walking interview, and I had a uh, non-participant observation, like between camera and the city, thanks to COVID. I couldn't get the result that I was expecting, but anyway, I tried. So um, that's mainly my methodology about in my research. Uh, I've also looked at the concealed and lived experience of visually impaired people, and uh, I, I was focusing on letters. Uh, studies on how cities are actually a social environment. 
Today, I'll focus on uh, something which is called uh, changing in the cities. Uh, as I encountered that for uh, many visually impaired people, it's problematic. But still, changing the city, um, as uh, Andrew May says, uh, changing the city is an essential and creative thing, as long as it is guys are similar to ignorance or race. So it's not a necessary value, but sometimes we may encounter an issue or we consider um, that um, fault and um, people. So first of all, VIPs and policy changes. You might find it and you might be surprised that why I have this sign, a smoking black sign. But it was interesting that I interviewed one of the uh, participants, they mentioned that. When in 2007, uh, actually smoking inside was banned. More people, they tried to, I mean, they aim to uh, smoke outside. So they were actually occupying the edge of the building. And it was problematic, why? Because those um, VIPs who used the, the edge of the building uh, to, uh, to navigate, they encountered the hazard and uh, tipping hazard issues. VIPs and social. Uh, when I interviewed some of the uh, urban designers, uh, one, one of them mentioned that probably the uh, you know the twenty minute city uh, is uh, approachable for urban people as they don't need to commute uh, frequently in the city. Uh, well, it sounds yes, good, but actually, we kind of uh, this kind of kind of approach really actually during the COVID nineteen in two thousand and twenty and two thousand and twenty one. When commuting was uh, problematic, and uh, there was some, and uh, due to lockdowns, we were able to commute. But on the other hand, uh, when I interviewed some experts, one of them mentioned that uh, in the form of anecdote that some uh, people said that it's yes, it's a, it's a, actually a positive thing that they don't need to negotiate the environment. But on the other hand, they need to actually they remove from the uh, public space everyone, including the IPs. And which is uh, I mean, it reduced the diversity in the city, which is a key to urbanity. So the question is to be seen or not to be seen. And the ideas are physical changes. Cities are evolving, and uh, it's one of the criteria of uh, cities that um, lots of uh, considerations happening all the time, especially in big cities. Well, uh, let's look at the public transport. It's very essential for vision people, as many of them can't uh, drive and they need uh, public transport to commute and get to their destination. Uh, the first station, it went through with a lot of uh, transformation from 2002 to 2006. But the interview actually between everybody, it wasn't really uh, compatible with their needs. Some said that it's echoing and they can't hear it, hear the announcements easily, or um, like uh, there, there's a ton of color contrast for those who can't actually detect colors. And we'll make sure that there is less and some part of the day is clear and they can't see properly. The other example is super stuff camps, very common in a city. But I, when I interviewed them, though the uh, IPs are actually blind, they find it very difficult to find it. As one of them mentioned that, uh, I prefer to use my guide and a book rather than to find these super subjects. But uh, actually these are um, mostly like usable for people who have a usable um, vision. So uh, there was this uh, uh, difference between a uh, person who is blind and people who have vision. And furniture. We have probably seen these around the city. I probably kind of like it, like there's some space uh, even, but originally painful as they can't detect these handrails. It's problematic and unfavorable for them to use uh, public furniture. The IPs and population changes. Uh, in the recent years, there's a like, growing population in the cities, essential level stage. And for built environment professionals, it's kind of a positive, a positive uh, um, thing. <laughs> Uh, I interviewed visual people. I asked them, what's your first impression of uh, such a method? They said that it's a busy, noisy environment and it makes it hard to navigate around the city. As one of them mentioned, that I need to change my head once a year as it breaks uh, um, throughout the year. 
And some may mention that the people are using their uh, cell phones all the time and they don't uh, pay attention to us. But uh, uh, that actually are uh, uh, having to be more impressive. Uh, in my I focused on that a city uh, is not confined, it shouldn't be confined to necessary activities. And for visually impaired people, it's not only about wayfinding issues. Uh, because uh, as the term says, urban spaces should be a uh, place for a uh, surprise. And then I also young impaired people. Uh, have you ever been surprised in the city? They, should, they said yes, for once. And um, which is actually hinders them from having a, a, an unplanned walking to enjoy the city, uh, to socialize in uh, some urban spaces. As one of the orientation and mobility specialists mentioned, I never really hear of any of my clients just doing an unplanned walk. And then I asked a victim of my professional, and they said that often when we think, think about the difference from people with vision impairment, we only focus on safe gas days instead of thinking about all the senses and how we amplify the enjoyment of the city and the experience of the city, which is such a key part of their environment and can uh, also work on it. So, um, if I want to wrap it up here, <laughs> and it means that a uh, city for visual impairment should be confined to physical aspects, social aspects, um, policy aspects, they're all related. And maybe change something, changing in the city might um, bring some um, positive, um, but uh, also it brings like, some problems for example, such as visual people. And uh, we shouldn't like bringing facility, it shouldn't be the need to kind of combine and move people from space. And city is beyond the for me. And at the end, I'd like to close my presentation with this fascinating photo of Helen Ware, woman and activist, deaf blind person, who actually uh, enjoyed uh, Chance and Women while walking in the city and uh, having an offline walk. Uh, so, which was a striking photo of that time, it was published in 1937 uh, to show uh, another uh, actually, um, you have perspective of uh, people with disabilities. Thanks for waiting. So now we have Imogen. Um, he's currently undertaking a doc uh, her doctoral research in inclusive workplace design at the Melbourne School of Design. Her research is focused on understanding physical and psycho emotional barrier to workplace access and participation for persons with disabilities and advancing inclusive design to create socially sustainable built environments. So Imogen is also a registered architect with, with over 10 years experience in multiple sectors. She is committed to the creation of buildings and cities which go beyond statutory accessibility requirements to create high quality, equitable and inclusive places where everyone feels they belong, Imogen. Great, uh, thanks. Um, I'd like to start with, um, Acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the custodians of country across all of the lands of Australia. Um, and uh, in particular, Wurundjeri country, where we're coming um, to you from today, but um, all the places where everyone online is also coming to today and pay my respects to elders past, present, uh, and emerging, and any Aboriginal or First Nations people that are joining us here today. Um, for our blind or low vision uh, friends who are here today. Um, I am a cis um, woman with, uh, in her mid thirties. I have glasses, uh, tortoise shell rim glasses and short wavy brown hair. I'm wearing a, uh, a dark outfit with black pants <laughs> and <laughs> And brown leather shoes. I have shoes and pants on, everyone. So, um, <laughs> and with that, we can get started. So, um, as Dolly said, I'm in the first year of my doctoral research, um, but also have a background of many years in professional practice as a registered architect. And I'm researching workplace inclusion um, and how that can be designed. So, just some background in Australia, we have a population <laughs> of around 25 million people. 4.4 million Australians have a disability. So that's about 18% or roughly one in six people. So it's pretty significant. Um, that's not a small number. 
Um, that means that probably everyone has some contact with someone with a disability in their life, whether they know it or not. Um, and when you consider that disability can affect anyone of any age, it can be visible or invisible. It can be sudden or gradual, but it can also be temporary or permanent. It's rather surprising that cities are still ableist and exclusionary uh, because um, that's a lot more of the population than just the 18% that that can impact. Um, Amy Hamray defines ableism in a particular way that I think is useful for me as an architect in how to think about it. Um, they describe it as ableism is the pervasive idea that a good or preferable life is one without disability. Now, um, <laughs> sorry, ah, no, back one, back one. Yeah, so Western architectural design and practice is actually underpinned by um, this idea that a, a good or preferable life is one without disability. So um, this might go to explain why cities are still ableist. And so this is just my reflection on the topic of today. Um, in the, on screen are some images from um, classical and Renaissance texts, uh, which describe um, some of the history of architecture. Uh, including the Vitruvian man um, and the development of um, some of the um, uh, uh, um, Greek um, orders. So um, these sorts of historical uh, proportioning systems developed from measuring particular kinds of bodies, typically fit um, men. And um, these uh, measurements were um, brought into architectural proportioning systems as idealised bodies, and particularly into some of the most important and aspirational architecture, like um, religious architecture. Um, and this doesn't really stop in the Renaissance. It moves on through history um, in the development of ergonomics and other um, sorts of proportioning systems in the 20th century. These are still measuring particular kinds of bodies, not diverse bodies across society. And so, um, and these are typically fit, able-bodied people. Um, so this idea of preferencing an able um, or a body without disability underpins the practice of architecture. Um, this is really well documented in this book, Building Access by Amy Hamray, and I'd recommend if anyone wants a really um, challenging and interesting read, that's one to... to go for. Um, but that's just a little background on my, that, to lead into my research problem and my kind of experience as a practicing architect. That doesn't even mention the social um, expectations. Architects come from a group of people, but so are the clients that commission buildings, um, the people who approve buildings um, and other consultants that realize them. Uh, and so certain social expectations come into play as well. So for my research problem, looking at Australia's disability strategy, the vision is to create an Australian society that ensures that people with disability can fulfill their potential as equal members of the community. And there's seven principles here, but um, for my research, I'm really just focusing on the first two um, principles. Don't know why it's not moving again. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, which are employment and financial security um, with the goal to increase employment for people with disabilities and inclusive homes and communities is the second um, policy priority. And in particular from that, I think of interest is to create a built and natural environment that's accessible, which enables the full participation of um, people in, in life. Um, and so for me, what I want to know is uh, what's the link between employment and built environment and what do architects and designers need to know in relation to this? Next slide, please. Um, so work and disability. What do we know about work and disability? I might give it another go. Yeah, that works. Oh, no, that one. <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
So this is um, some statistics from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. We know that unemployment disproportionately affects people with disability. 48% uh, of people with disabilities are employed, but 80% of people without disabilities are employed. Um, that's a really significant difference. And not only that, people with disabilities have more precarious employment, they're more likely to be underemployed, they're more likely to be unemployed. And this is happening even though diversity and inclusion is a really hot topic right now and particularly trendy, right? So we've got um, a report that's been written, this is actually quite a while ago now in 2013 by Deloitte about the benefits of inclusion. Um, lots of news articles that are coming up, in, including recently Queensland businesses to put people with disability on their recruitment radar. We've also got um, big companies that are committing to disability inclusion in their workplaces like Accenture and Google. Google has a, um, a disability alliance, they call it, as a, a particular um, group within um, their organisation uh, to uh, focus on disability. And even though we have these things, um, nevertheless, um, the figure is not moving, um, nor are my slides. Um, <laughs> and we also know that people with disability want to work. And this is what Dylan Alcott is advocating for in the next slide, please do. Um, he um, spoke recently at the Jobs Summit and said, um, some people with disability want a job for sure, but do you know what else some people want? They want a career, they want a leadership position. I don't want to scare you, but we want your seats. And why not? We have a workforce shortage in Australia and we need more diversity on boards and in businesses. Um, but nevertheless, these um, employment figures are pretty stagnant. What do we know about architecture and disability? We know that the built environment directly contributes to disadvantage. There's a lot of research on this. Um, uh, and I've just named a few uh, up there on the, on the slide and we, I won't go into it. Um, but we know that the built environment contributes directly to disadvantage by being um, overtly physically inaccessible, but also in subtle ways by um, perpetuating disabled, um, uh, perpetuating disabling views of an individual's place in society or their worth. Um, scholar Donna Reeve refers to this as psycho-emotional disabledism. It's sort of the idea that um, you can ex install an accessible solution, but if it's too distressing to use, it's still a barrier. Um, and one of the ones um, that uh, I think is an interesting one, which I might just mention, that Shalara and I have spoken about <laughs> is um, <laughs> fire, fire stairs don't need to have two handrails but people use fire stairs all the time to move throughout buildings. And if you have a guide dog that walks on a particular side of your body, but the handrail's on the wrong side, um, it's actually quite a perilous thing to use. And that's not a big deal to put an extra handrail in a fire stair. It's really not uh, in, when you think about it in terms of the cost of the overall building um, and the ease of designing that in, or the additional space that it takes, not a big deal. Um, and uh, Donna Reeve argues that these psycho-emotionally disabling things um, occur because of assumptions that are made by building designers. Now, the next thing that we know is that the World Health Organization and World Bank in their report um, on disability identified that there's a lack of disability awareness amongst um, architects, planners, built environment professionals, the very people that deliver buildings. Um, so it's not hard to then make the leap between lack of awareness and the assumptions that Donna Reeve points out that um, designers make. Next slide, please, Billy. Um, if you could just go back one. So just to simplify that, yeah, just to simplify that, we know that the built environment directly contributes to disadvantage overtly by being physically inaccessible and subtly through psycho-emotional disabilism and we have lack of disability awareness. So the question is, how does this manifest in workplace design? I wanna know how this impacts workers with lived experience of disability. Um, and um, is this impacting their employment? And what are the poorly informed decisions that have been made uh, by designers and building managers? So the research question that I'm posing is, 
how does the design of, con of the contemporary of contemporary office workplaces contribute to the exclusion of people with disabilities from employment participation? Um, I'm looking at office buildings for my research, and the reason being that um, oh, that's too small on the slides. I'll just describe it. Um, the majority of people with disabilities um, work as professionals or in clerical and administrative positions. So this is the type of work that typically occurs within office spaces. Um, and so um, as, as is the most uh, dominant kind of work uh, for people without disabilities in Australia as well. So, um, and um, I will be using um, case study and critical ethnography approach um, for my research. It's really important to me uh, to use criticality studies to underpin everything that I do. This questions how knowledge came to be, why we accept particular things as truth, um, and, okay, <laughs> and um, I'm nearly there anyway. Um, uh, and I will be um, interviewing people, workers with lived experience, um, and uh, um, using in the critical ethnography and observing the way that people use space, um, but also in the case study of the buildings, going through um, archival research, looking at how the buildings are represented, um, what was the intent of the space, um, and some oral history, um, talking to the designers and building managers uh, as to how decisions were made um, and why things came to be the way that they are. Um, so this is so that I can understand what's actually currently happening in these spaces. What are the experiences that, um, that people with lived experience have? Um, what do designers need to know? And um, how could design improve? Uh, this is because we want to have workplace inclusion by design, not exclusion by oversight. And that's me. Thanks. I'll hand over to Anita. The last speaker for this session is Anita Tackler, who is also a doctor and editor at the Melbourne School of Design. Her research interest lies in disabilities in urban environments. She holds a Master of Philosophy from the University of Melbourne and a Bachelor of Architecture from Chandigarh College of Architecture, Australia, and same that in India. Prior to shifting her career focus onto academia, um, Benita worked for over 10 years as a senior associate in an architectural firm in Bolivia, uh, Designers International, and she worked on many award winning commercial and housing projects. And for her presentation today, Benita will present a research titled Pursuit of Happiness for Real Power Mobility Device Users in Urban Public Space. Um, yeah. So privileged to be a part of this ECR panel in the Able Cities Symposium. So thank you, co-convenience, co for giving us a chance to present our micro research in endeavors in this stage. And we can sense a growing revolt in society in this room, even in the disability community against Able Cities. And why not? In everyday simple acts that are taken by many of us in a natural stride, such as going to work, school, shops, or simply going to for a stroll and meeting friends, disabled people are faced with excessive mobility and excess limitations, social and experiential inequities in our streets, neighborhoods, and cities. And the built environments have created inequitable conditions that discriminate, segregate, and marginalize the disabled. In my master's project earlier on exploring wheelchair inclusive streets, and on the basis of my personal experiences of accompanying my son, a wheelchair user, I am familiar firsthand with the unwelcoming, exclusionary, and confidence setting nature of the public spaces. And it is grossly unacceptable. So there seems to be some inherent contradictions in our thought processes that we must resolve first. My current PhD research, it investigates the way to promote happiness and positivity for wheel power mobility device users, which includes mobility scooters and power wheelchairs in public spaces. The photographs which I have here are from the disability archives. <laughs> On your left is Jeffrey Bell, a pioneer in the Australian disability rights movement. At a protest in 1978 against the lack of disabled access to public infrastructure, 
And on Friday, the protest going on in Melbourne CBD by wheelchair users in the mid-1980s. The discontent expressed in these photographs was a part of worldwide activism and organized movement at the beginning of the 1980s. And cities started to become responsive only to the, need, to the needs of disabled people, largely due to the socio-political pressures that were mounted on city authorities because of such demonstrations. Today, there is a growing awareness, acceptability, legislation, code, standards, and innovations in wheelchair technology that enable wheeled wise users to access public spaces more freely than they could do three decades ago when the Disability Discrimination Act was passed. However, despite more opportunities for independent movement and social environmental connectivity coming their way, People with disabilities continue to deplore the negativity they experience in the public spaces. And the recent public hearing 28 conducted by the Disability Royal Commission Australia is the testament of rudeness, harassment, and objection that are a part of everyday life for people with disabilities, including those using wheelchairs in urban public spaces. And this situation points to apparent contradictions that persist in policy making and urban designing that we need to resolve as a priority. And this raises some important questions. Are we designing our public spaces wrong? Where are we going wrong? And what needs to change in place making? Uh, we'll return to these questions subsequently. Uh, next one, Danny. For my project, I reviewed literature in the three academic fields, which were disability studies, urban sciences, particularly urban design, and the happiness studies. I wouldn't go in much detail here, but I want to highlight that currently, wheel mobility device user in the public realm sits at the intersection of disability studies and urban studies, which is highlighted in the gray circle on your right. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see that right, but I have got that wheelchair user and the mobility scooter on this side here. Yep. Uh, so what we've been hearing about the code from Angela and what are these excess code standards are focused on getting the wheelchairs, the machines up and about moving through the cities, though we hope to increase it to go beyond the standards. And we can see there's a growing interest in empirical studies in exploring the environmental and the experiential elements that can boost human happiness. In fact, the COVID pandemic has revived one of the oldest questions in architecture and design. Can we design for happiness? And the designers are optimistic that it can be done through appropriate policy decisions and the design. Our next one, Dalik. But surprisingly, the discourses of joy and happiness are largely missing from the disability studies. And this I have indicated in this red circle. And this red circle is where my present research sits. Uh, I further explored various disability access evaluation methods in practice and in research from 1990s to the present times. And as conveyed on this slide, a spectrum can be spotted within, within the overall continent between the methods that are more inclined to the physical needs of the users, as in the blue, to those towards the psychoemotional needs, as in the pink. And the current practice methods are very much limited to the blue side. The pink side is the psychoemotional aspects, which remain somewhat underexplored. Uh, and from here, we will return to the placemaking for wheelchair power mobility device users. So where could we be going wrong? My study and understanding so far finds the contemporary placemaking approaches for the wheel mobility device users. One, they are mobility reductionists that they largely disregard. And two, they largely disregard the psycho-emotional experiences. And disability scholars, Watermeyer and Swartz, Watermeyer has a lived experience of disability himself, see this as a silencing of a layer of their experience. Then number three, there's an over-reliance on 
universal design principles with inadequate monitoring mechanisms. And fourth is an unsatisfa unsatisfactory engagement with the primary users or the wheelchair users for my study. Next slide. So what needs to change? My understanding is that incremental improvements and technology mobility related fixes alone are not enough. A full and meaningful inclusion of wheel mobility device users first, we need a holistic approach which is multidisciplinary. Two, that encourages taking note of the psycho-emotional aspects. Instead of doing wheelchair users as physical entities moving through the streets, we should regard them as humans who have emotions and who are alive to experience it. What we need is people-centric, value-based approaches. And then lastly, there's a need to reconcile the perceptions of the users and designers for any meaningful results. To round up, my project concentrates on expanding the conception of human needs beyond the physical needs to also consider the psycho-emotional needs and aspirations of wheeled power mobility device users in public spaces. And the findings are, findings are expected to inform policy framing that addresses the emotional needs and aspirations of the users. And in this regards, has developed a hypothetical model for happiness and well-being for wheel mobility devices in the public realm. It is built upon the five themes taken from the literature studies, the human values of convenience, comfort, confidence, congeniality, and contentment. However, this model is just a starting point. It's just a hypothetical model, and I am working in the field studies to define and expand it further. And I have developed an innovative approach for this research, the bilateral approach, which I call the bilateral approach. This is a hybrid ethnographic approach that builds upon first the empathy-based designing where the urban designers join the wheelchair users in in situ walk along discussions and observations to gain first-hand insights into the user's experience. Two, Digital ethnography, where digital technologies, tools of sensors are used to study human needs, behaviors, experience, and emotions in real-world environments. Three, furthermore, unlike conventional approaches that focus largely on the users, both the users and the designers are under scrutiny in this didactic approach. And this understanding, I hope, can provide possible explanations for for the current user designer disconnect. And the photograph from here is from one of the field studies where the sport worker also joined in. And three of them were happy for me not to blur their faces. So you can see them here. And to make my observations more communicative and comprehensive, I have bent my research according to the evidence-based traditions both members are fitted with light variable devices, in particular, E4 wristbands, GoPro cameras, voice recorders, and smartphones on their journey through the street sections. What in particular E4 watches do is they capture the physiologic, physiological changes in the heart and the skin conductors activity. So that gives us a clear idea of the emotional stresses going through them. And we all know neg negotiating public spaces in wheelchairs can be stressful. And the data from the Empatica watches can actually provide the factual verification for this. And then we are using the GoPro cameras to video record, record the environment at the respective eye levels of both the users and the people in wheelchairs to provide the spatial context to the stress-triggered hotspots and voice recorders record any conversations in the journey. And the journeys are conducted in the Swanston Street at Melbourne CBD between the Flinders Street Station and the Franklin Street, as shown in the red arrow, which is a length of around 1.4 kilometers one way. And the cross streets, as you can see in the bottom figure, 
They break this segment into 10 sub-segments, which vary considerably in character, content, rhythms, and temporalities, as we will see in the next slide. And this provides us ample opportunity to map the perceptions, emotions, subjectivities of real vice users in the diverse context. And I am aware that this particular street is considered to be better accessible than other streets in Melbourne, especially the cross streets, and may not give a balanced picture and offer a true representational frame of experiences for wheelchair users in these streets. However, intentionally, I am avoiding the trap of harping upon the streets, which are difficult to move in, because my priority is to extract the psycho-emotional experiences of using those public spaces. And I don't want the mobility concerns to unduly influence the results. And these are some of the photographs from the ongoing fieldwork. And considering the fieldwork explained in detail, and it may be mentioned here that the data is still pouring in and is yet to be collated and analyzed. However, I'm optimistic of the expected outcomes that the project has the potential to inform better policy frame framing for the happiness of real device users. And that is all from you. Thank you. So we may um, have one or two more questions from the audience. I know that's five minutes between lunch and um, yeah, our discussion. So please feel free to ask questions. Anyone? Oh, I'll jump in. Yeah. Sorry, but um, you mentioned and um, you, you both mentioned the over reliance on universal design. Can you explain what that means? Do you want oh, to sorry, you know, I think you mentioned it. Yeah, no, I swear you missed me. Yeah, all right. Okay. I was like, I don't think I mentioned that. Um, yeah, right. I did mention about the overly reliance because all the policies and documents that you see that has go beyond the minimum design standards and follow the universal design principles. So that is generally taken as an assumption that you design it for everyone. But the discussions, the informal discussions that I've had with people with disabilities, they think they have been marginalized on it. And especially if we take the power of wheelchair users I'm talking about, they have all different abilities. Because one of the power, he was in one of the studies, uh, he could just run, for, I mean, build his wheelchair fast through the streets. But then there was a little man who was using a micro joystick. And whenever he would go down those curves, his fingers would fall off the joystick and he was not able to drive. So I think the overly reliance on the universal design principle is marginalizing the people, not really, in, I mean, it's not a holistic approach that they are all included in that designing. Hope I have satisfied this or not? Uh, I've got a number of very things about that. I mean, yeah, I'm very curious about that, that space, that crossover between access and universal design, obviously, is kind of evolving and growing. Um, I might just add a comment yeah. um, initially to that, which is that um, the universal design principles um, in theory are, are, are quite aspirational and I think um, worth certainly considering, but when it comes to applying them to a designed built environment, they can be really challenging to actually apply as a designer, um, particularly if you don't have existing knowledge of what any of those things mean. Um, and as, as we're aware, there's a lack of disability awareness training um, amongst uh, architects and built environment professionals. So that I, I think is one of the problems with the universal design principles, but I still think they're useful and I still think that they should be referred to by um, designers. If you would like to comment, Marianne. I don't want to take up the session. Jennifer really wants to ask a question. Thanks, Maria. Um, thanks for that. I do enjoy all these presentations. Thanks for what made you uh, any stands in the universe of design. Are we in any sessions? Sorry. 
what's the kind of like you think so we can have people in that space that um, that you just was like but again you can think that it's around the world as well. The principles of universal design and the fact that accessibility is part of universal design but it's a magical and we can find a culture in my community. So those are the issues to grapple with how you put into play the principle but uh, I guess from the work that we do around policy and um Keen to see ways that you overcome that barrier with such principles are at a point to everyone. So we think that universal design principles are important. They don't meet the needs there. Um, should we have to do something better about how we're demonstrating and being issues with that? Oh, it's it's a can you please repeat the main part of the question that Leo was not share? Yeah, I, I guess just to, just to end the comments around uh, in the general area. Still there, but I guess it's a fairly balanced universal design principles. I mean, the actual principles of universal design are just including using disability, thinking of cultural needs, language needs, spending with each care. So, Struggling for how to understand, you know, like in terms of writing policy and practice and demonstrating the people are struggling, how they can move forward, it's saying that the key principles are not just Can I give a practical example of UDL going wrong? So, if, we, if we're working, um, looking at toilets, which is human right in public, and I use an accessible, the accessible toilets as well because I Nine times out of ten can't fit into a cubicle with the diet of the normal toilets with the normal norm. Going to a um, accessible toilet and they've taken away the um the UDL, they've taken away the manual lock so that people with dexterity issues can just push a button. That's fantastic. But if there's no braille on the lock uh, on those buttons. I don't know which button to push to lock the door. And I have often been mid business, shall we say, with the door flying open. So it's UDL principles, they're looking at all that accessibility, but still we're looking at accessible products for dominantly for wheelchair users, not for other access issues, including vision and pen with the budget. And if I may add to that, Universal design as such just remains a theory. It is a good theory. Every can be included, everyone can be included in it. But when it comes to be translating into the design practices, as she said, it literally fails majority of the people with disabilities. And initially it was a universal design that started as a concept for people with disabilities. But in this process, it is right. We need everyone, all stakeholders are invited to be a particip participate in that space. But then we don't want like few people, if they are marginalized, maybe the 10% out of the total disabled, that is not really good. And this is happening because there are not enough monitoring uh, standards or mechanisms. And I think Marion's research, she has done a fair bit of work on this. And we need to expand the universal design is good, no doubt, but it has to be taken a better place. It needs expansion and the better fields so that it becomes more inclusive. I think this is really an interesting discussion around, if, you know, start from universal design. And I think that's the main purpose of this, um, you know, um, gathering is really to start that conversation and see what those principles can do or how can we improve on those uh, principles, but they, they are definitely a good starting point. Mm -hmm. And um, if, because we're already at time, so maybe by Peggy Ibanshen and Shireen to say, you know, one last, one last sentence um, each, and then everyone might be. I think just to add on to the discussion of universal design, because I think that's super interesting. There's a lot of debate um, amongst uh, within scholarship but other uh, other spheres as well about whether universal design is really um, at the correct sort of terminology. It implies that there's a universal experience, but actually um, there's so much diversity. Uh, and I think um, 
we can already see that there tends to there can often be a privileging of certain kinds of disabilities over others and this is problematic within our building codes um, as well uh, and certainly we don't have anything to account for um, the more more subtle issues of exclusion and discrimination so I think that's something to kind of take away and think about are some of those issues of psycho-emotional disabilism as well as physical inaccessibility. Uh, Dara Lee, it's Michael here. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, Michael. <laughs> sorry, sorry to jump in. I've just come in on the end of this. Uh, a lot of the thi lot of the things that uh, Michael, the uh, talking oh, sorry, about. Um, yes, yeah, so Michael is our um, keynote speaker this afternoon, and he will be talking yeah. a lot about um, uh, universal design. So, Michael. Yeah, I'm just saying it, it's it's interesting to uh, to listen to that in regards to references of over-reliance or universal design. In my keynote speaking, I'll address all those sort of things and the commitments and what the pure sense of universal design is about. And I will talk about how it's been hijacked in the accessibility area and talked about the diverse nature that we are and how we design. So I'm looking forward to giving you that keynote to answer a lot of those questions that the, 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 the ladies have raised in their research. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Awesome. Um, yeah, so we move to Shireen. Uh, in my view, the uh, notion of universal design is uh, a positive uh, aspect. But uh, as actually, when I was doing interview with, uh, with the environment professionals, one of them mentioned that uh, design for all actually means that design for nobody. So that's the challenge of it. So how to include all people. Thank you. Um, yeah, so let's give our speakers a round of applause. On accessible housing, um, I'd like just to just do an acknowledgement to the country first. So acknowledge ours past, present, and emerging. I'll just acknowledge the rich and creative culture that is Indigenous culture and then can the architecture draw on that. So, my name is Raylene West. I'm a um, uh, Melbourne University research fellow. Uh, we've got two great panelists speaking this afternoon. Our first panelist is Dr. Kirsten Day. Who's speaking on designing the design studio for people with disability in your own festival? Dr. Kirsten Day lectures in architecture at the University of Melbourne. She coordinates construction as alchemy and architectural practice. She's a member of the education committee and co chair of the research and practice committee with the Australian Institute of Architects Victoria and an examiner for architects registration board in Victoria. Kirsten is a registered architect and director of the Norman Day and Associates Architect with over 20 years of experience working in the profession. Her publications, workshop and studios explore themes of future scenarios and the impact of change on the architectural profession and the human condition. She was the invited speaker on the subject Future Design, Future Melbourne as part of Melbourne Design Week for the Design Institute of, Institute of Australia and involved in design of future projects for Melbourne Knowledge Week since 2018. She organised the International Conference Future Housing, Global Issues, Regional Problems at Swinburne in 2016, with Architecture Media Politics Society as part of the Housing Community Conference series. Our other speaker today is Associate Professor Ilan Weasel. Ilan is an Associate Professor in Urban Geography at the School of Geography, Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Melbourne. His research seeks to understand what a disability in the city might look like and how we might achieve it in practice. This includes a particular focus on housing for people with disability and other elements of social inclusion and exclusion, such as participation of people with intellectual disability in mainstream urban services. So looking forward to both great speakers. Thanks, so much, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's fine. It's fine. Um, I will. I will be reading carefully, or not too carefully. Um, it's it's that time of year, and I'm sure everyone is feeling it's that time of year. Um, but there's a couple of key points that I wanted to discuss about the studios that we've been running, and um, we can yeah. Sorry, I couldn't find out. the button. Oh, 
try. <laughs> It's it's coming from this. It's on this screen. That helps. Yeah, or maybe. Yeah, we could do that. Unless we would kill me. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. it's not on the end. Um, yeah, because the files are actually really good. Okay, but I'm not sure why. Um, yeah, maybe person, if you have a look here um, on my screen. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so I, I can find it. Okay. Share. Ah, uh, because I need to do it. <laughs> Got it. Sorry about that. My bad. My sake. <laughs> oh, I know. We will talk about this. <laughs> There you go. Fabulous. Thanks. Um, we can probably go to the next slide. So I'm Dr. Kirsten Day, and um, I'm going to talk about the design studios that Andrew and I have run over the last four years. Our theme is designing for neurodiversity, and we have side adventures into accessibility. Um, and I'll talk particularly about one of the recent studio we've run. So this, um, this also means it's not just the student um, design outcomes that we're looking at, but we're also looking at the method of communication that they use. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so these are the um, different studios that we've done, and today they've been fairly residential in nature, and that's also made a very steep learning curve for our students as they sort of navigate SDA housing um, and sort of more general issues around um, universal design. So although next year we are starting to look at um, design for workspaces and I'm going to test out the new UK standards for neurodiversity. Um, as we've developed momentum for our different studios, we've also um, been able to use our roof for this year's um, the Victorian chapter Australian Institute of Architects student prize, which one of our students won. Um, and we had two commendations as well, which was great. And with the semester that's just passed, um, we were able to extend our studio a little bit further with the help um, from a grant from um, MDI, and which meant that we were able to get Marianne Jackson on board, which was um, fabulous uh, for our students, but also the <coughs> fabulous for Andrew and I, actually, because it, it meant that we were able to engage in a more um, meaningful way, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, so if we go to the next one, so the key developments um, that we've had over the semesters and also over the different iterations of the studio really starts with ableist language and assumptions about how people use the built environment. And what do students think about or how do they consider as normal? Because they will talk about their design and then go, oh, and this is the normal space. And this is for the normal thing. And it's just like, okay, let's, um, let's have this discussion again. Um, and while we have many students who have friends and family with lived experience of disability, our cohort is overwhelmingly able-bodied and neurotypical. And so our role is to ensure that the spaces they design do not segregate or exclude people. And so we've had, there's the work that Andrew and I have done, um, but we've also collaborated, collaborated with Marianne Jackson and with Sam Kashik, who over several research projects publications and conference papers, which has been fantastic because as we've moved through those, we've been able to sort of to enrich our teaching practice. Um, we'll go to the next one. Okay, so over the years, our key, um, our key projects, so people have worked around sensory elements. Um, we have a lot of work about pets and the inclusion of pets in spaces, um, in housing. Um, and I'll show you one particular project from this semester that was great. Um, we also have a look at um, art and creative spaces, skill development, so beekeeping was included in that. We have a lot of students working with biophilia, um, things that are specific to demographics. So in the thesis program, the students will then do their own research. So we'll provide them with a particular site or a particular program, and then they will start to build their own a cohort that they're going to design for. 
Um, the other one, particularly with this last one, it's been really interesting because when you have, um, and it's been great that students are now able to go to visit buildings and to see what um, buildings actually look like that have been designed for people with different abilities, um, is the idea about public and private space and that what we consider to be private spaces like bathrooms or bedrooms are not necessarily very private spaces if you need assistance in those spaces to get in and out of the bed, to have a shower and go to the toilet. And I have to stop going off my record or pick off my track. <laughs> I'll be here all afternoon. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, please. So um, what's really important in terms of our studio is that there are new changes to architectural competencies that are coming into effect now um, and this year. And so this also means that we have two competencies for um, access that impact on accessibility. Go to the next so these are the two competencies that are expected at the point of graduation. There's another one that's expected at the point of registration. So Andrew and I presented at the Architectural Science Association last week um, addressing these issues in a paper called The Architecture of Inclusion, Can the Profession Adapt to the Diversity of Design Demanded by People with a Disability? And we had a look at these standards and the new competence, because these competencies are derived from skills that are perceived to be deficient for um, graduate architects. And there's a whole other conversation about trying to fit all of the things that people need to know into a two-year master's degree. That's another argument at another time. But when finalising our paper, what was really interesting for us is reviewer number two, reviewer number two is always interesting, <laughs> um, who provided us a challenge as to whether lived experience was relevant when teaching able-bodied and neurotypical students about um, design for neurodiversity and disability. Isn't compliance to standards enough? Uh, which is something that the candidates has been talked about this morning. And isn't empathy enough? Um, this also returns to um, Angela's presentation this morning. Um, go to the next one. So these are the competencies that our students are expected to have an understanding of at the point of registration or graduation. And the next one. And um, but does this sort of compliance really give us an understanding of um, what disability is? And I'll go to the next one, which I think should be yes, my people. So um, when we're thinking about the studio, um, I'm going to read this first before I go into that. So in terms of what does it mean as a graduate or someone at the point of registration two to three years later understanding um, who they're designing for. And then returning to um, reviewer number two, we, Andrew and I found this as an interesting taunt um, because Andrew teaches UX design and I teach applied design thinking as part of the grad certificate for design for health and wellness. And so during COVID, we relied heavily on user mapping scenarios, day in the life um, exercises, which were useful, but nothing beats having a conversation with someone who has to plan out their entire day thinking about logistical pain points every day. So our students on the left, while it's there's sort of the empathy element of I'm in a wheelchair and I've been wheeling myself around for an hour, isn't this great? Right. At the end of that session, they can get up out of the chair, they can go to the bathroom, they can go and have lunch, go and grab a coffee, get on a bus, the first bus or pet or tram that arrives. And while there's empathy, there's not that experience. And to on the right, we have um, Ray Lifchess, um, which is something that Andrew and I are looking at um, more in depth over the summer break. Um, and so while this is still considered radical, was to bring people with disability into the classroom to contribute equally to the debate. And I'll return to this a little bit later. Um, so the next one, um, and I might try and skip through as much of this. So when it comes to architecture, much of our design experience has been quite poor. Much of how we design has been directly linked to social norms about how we treat people living with disability. So in the early years of Australian settlement, um, many social um, expectations and norms were transplanted directly from England. Similarly, similarly, building styles and typologies, the earliest building regulations were directly sourced from England. 
and in terms of the treatment of people with disability and prevailing orthodoxy, um, known as the charity model at this time, advocated placing people with severe disability into institutions or asylums where they remain out of sight. So the first um, asylum we had was Castle Hill in New South Wales in 1811. That was a repurposed army barracks. Um, but with Gladesville, this was our first um, purpose-built asylum. And then we also have, um, in Melbourne, we have the Q Asylum, which was based on Colney Hatch. Um, and what was interesting is that the, the contents of our first building regulations reflected the treatment of people with a disability in institutions uh, disconnected from everyday society. First, the next one. So then we've gone to a medical model from the 1940s. And in part of this, and, I'm, I'm, and I know that I'm heavily relying on a lot of Mary Ann's research here. So, you know, you just, you could actually present this before me. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, so the premise of this model was that the person with a disability had something wrong with them and that the medical system of doctors and scientists would fix them. And so architecturally and operationally, the medical model of disability was still largely institutional in nature. And so, uh, so it, this was originally adopted by local councils and these uniform building regulations continue to reflect the institutionalized people uh, even with the disability. The next slide, we move to the seventies where we have a social model of disability. And I'm gonna try and get this, so we can run out of time. With these, the um, community residential units, rooms for three to eight residents, typically with individual bedrooms and common areas. The treatment or day to day management was carried out in the same premises or service centre nearby. And the residents had very limited control over where they lived, who they lived with, and what the daily routines were. So these units became compulsory for councillors to apply to new buildings. And once again, the contents reflected the prevailing attitude towards the housing of people with disability. So then we go to the 1990s and we moved to a natural building standard. The Building Code of Australia was first published in 1988 and adopted in Victoria in 1990. Um, so the following year, the um, Australian Uniform Building Regulatory Coordinating Council, there's a reason why I'm reading, <laughs> um, commissioned the development for the Model Building Act designed to assist state level governments in introducing standardized building acts across the country. So we introduced ours in 1993. And at this time, the BCA didn't refer to um, disability in the sections on domestic dwellings. This was solely referred to in class three buildings. So this is intended to be a house um, with unrelated people in sole occupancy units. And examples of this, including boarding houses, hotels, student accommodation, detention centres, accommodation for the aged, children or people with a disability. The next slide is our Q cottages, which sort of perfectly sort of summarises this, where we've gone from the asylum through to the hospitals for treatment, and then our final is where it's all been sold off and is now private housing. Where did that just from? So when it comes to competency changes, um, there's a similar set of concerns that were raised about the introduction of um, working with Indigenous knowledge, particularly for academics and how we start to um, put that information to our students. And the importance of listening to people with lived experience. There was a paper I did for the DRS conference, um, which I'm happy to share about that if anyone's interested. Um, but what was really important with this is not just about listening to people with lived experience, but also providing tools for um, communication um, and engagement with the community. So let's get to our studio. So um, our studio, we ended up, it was an interesting journey. Um, we started with a grant for um, doing some work in Wodonga. We then started to talk to um, service providers and we ended up in Albury, Wodonga. And so we had 11 students. It was the first time that our students had actually been face-to-face. -face. Um, many of them had been online. So this was a really good experience for them. And we also had two community partners. So one was um, the housing and service provider, Kiranari, and they were a good, 
very generous host for us. And also the city of Wodonga and their access advisory group, which became a much more important um, point of reference than we had initially um, anticipated. So I'll go to the next slide, please. So this is, um, and it's, it is very difficult to see. Um, so Jay Layton was one of our students and her work was looking at um, pets and specifically assistant dogs and how there is no mention, well, actually there's preference that there are no animals in SDA housing. She was looking at the NDIS and how this might be adapted to include pets. So this was one of two presentations that our students made, one that was specific to the access group and the other is for the university. So one of the great things with working with a grant is that you have an amazing access to a, an access consultant um, who has, and so then having the resources to consult with the committee. And Marianne took up a whole lot of um, projects from previous semesters and asked the committee, what was, how, how were they able to best engage with that piece of information? And, um, and we'll come back to that. But this was um, a much, a very condensed version of what the student would then present as part of their um, university um, expectations. Um, next slide, please. So this is our students um, on site. They're at a um, robust housing and development in Lavington, which is one of the suburbs of Albury. And there were lots of vivid descriptions by the, um, the Kiranari group um, talking about the design process, but also about post occupancy and how people might use this space. This particular um, robust housing unit was abandoned by the person who was meant to be in that because they didn't like being in that space. Um, they were there for a night and then took all their clothes off and ran into the middle of the road and ended up living in a um, a, a scout shed that had all the glass removed um, because of sensor, sensorial um, desires to sort of cover themselves. Um, but yeah, there was too much light, um, there was too many people around. So it was either that where you keep them, keep this man, and we're glad that when we were there, he had his clothes on um, in that environment. All the alternative is that he's homeless. And so I think for our students to see that firsthand and to hear those stories was really important because it's one thing to read it, it's another thing to have those discussions. Um, right. And it was really important in understanding the complex spectrum of housing requirements, particularly around um, issues of neurodiversity. So we'll go to the next slide. So one of the challenges um, during the semester was actually having that constant engagement because everybody's busy. The subject goes on, 12 weeks goes very, 14 weeks in this case goes very quickly. Also a uh, service provider um, is also busy and has their own agendas. So we managed to eat pizza with them um, and have regular contact, but there is that, if we're thinking about how we run our studios, there is additional, um, requirements that are needed. And we'll go to the next one. So our students ended up with um, two presentations. And the first was a very concise set of documents that were easily understood for non-architects, very clear and visible with a very large one to 50 floor plan. Um, this set of documents went up with Marianne to the um, access committee. And also one of our members, um, Cheryl, the Access Committee was blind. And so we printed 3D plans and <laughs> our students then did a five minute audio description of their, their main project. And so for us, it was fabulous that she was able to then listen and respond and to be able to engage. Um, go to the next one. So our studio, <laughs> like in anything that relies on technology is always fun. Um, once we got going, it's a very different. So normally in a face-to-face -face studio, there'll be people sitting on those front stair seats. There's that engaged conversation, the student's incredibly stressed. Uh, but in this case, it was the, um, the camera, we're talking to um, 
be doing the first presentation, which was to, to listen to what the student was saying. What was really interesting with that is uh, often when we talk about architecture, because it's so visually dominant, we'll sort of point to the images and go, this is great. But what we say isn't necessarily the most dominant thing because we're relying on such a visual image. But in this case, we've got someone who is really listening because that and 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 their plan is um quite fascinating. Oh, her involvement in the project is fascinating. Um, so Mary and um worked with Cheryl, and it was an amazing experience for the students. We did teary in Melbourne <laughs> um, to listen to her questions and commentary. And for this, it's it's that how do you challenge when architectural communication is so heavily biased towards visual representation? Um, because yeah, we say pictures, there's some indecipherable words and some handy movements, and then it, it was a first for many students to have to rely on that. So we'll go to the next one as I direct. So this is a student to the left. Um, we have a student, Nikki, in the red, who's presented on the wall. Um, and then we have on the other side is the um, projection of the Zoom team uh, where we had um, Kiranari and Aubrey, Marianne, Dodonga, and uh, Chris um, in Melbourne who was joining us online. So I think the next one is just my summary. So just some concluding ideas. Initially, we were looking at co-design and what was really interesting is um, as Andrew and I were preparing this, we listened to a presentation that Ray made about co-design and that it really needs to be considered and thought about, particularly with the community that we are working with. There needs to be an understanding that not everyone can be there Tuesday at 9.30, rain, hail or shine, because there are a whole lot of other logistics and things that need to be considered. Um, produ producing output is also thinking about how we communicate our ideas. I'm just going to read from here. Um, and also this idea of competence and ticking boxes and what does that actually mean. With our current um, teaching pedagogies and studio education, they are profoundly exclusive for people with a disability. And this is something that we're wanting to look at in more detail over the next few semesters. The next part was just a, um, it started out as a, a thought bubble that didn't get finished, um, which was really about the issues around architectural um, documentation and what we need to produce for a student to demonstrate architectural competency in terms of the documentation that they need to produce to say, yes, you can graduate as an architect. And then there's also the documentation that we need to produce to have meaningful uh, communication, which is something that we also need to think about as we develop the studio a bit further. And what makes this problematic then sort of is the question that we start um, we're, we're addressing this question about how do we adapt um, the profession to a diversity of design to include people with disability. And that is a response for okay. student. Thanks, Coast Sam. Thanks, Ray. Where should I stand here as well? Yeah, um, hi everyone, Ilan Vigil. I'm a, a geographer at the University of Melbourne at the School of Geography. Um, so my presentation today is um, very non-academic actually. It's really sort of thinking through advocacy for policy change around housing and thinking about what is looking at the landscape of current housing for people with disability in Australia across the full range of disabilities, seeing what the, the gap is, what the current situation is, where are the gaps, trying to think through a few different uh, sectors and issues uh, to come up with quite a, a kind of big picture plan and part of, I guess, work with lots of other advocacy organizations trying to impact policy. And it's a really critical moment now. There's a review of the NDIS, and I'll talk a bit about the NDIS and housing really problematic issue. So there's an opportunity with the review of the NDIS to see some policy, policy change at that side. Uh, there's a lot of happening in the housing policy side with social housing initiatives at state level, at federal level, 
and trying to think we want there, there is no very good picture of what is the actual level of need uh, there's a lot of fog if you read through documents published by the NDIS or state government or for federal government you, you, you can't make sense of what's actually the issue uh, so I guess it's trying to create some sense at a very high level before drilling down into the details so uh, an overview I'll start with some numbers. Um, this is work from 2016, very out of date, uh, but that's probably the only uh, set of figures you would find about the actual level of need and where people with disability, uh, and I'm talking particularly people with uh, what's, I guess, defined in the census as uh, severe and profound disability. Uh, so this work by the Disability Housing Futures Group, it was a sort of advocacy group that I was part of, uh, we tried to, we looked at a few different sources of data and try to come up with the numbers. So it's really challenging. I don't know how accurate it is because the data is not very accurate, but um, it kind of gives you a picture uh, that about close to half of the people who are adults, 25 to 64, are uh, living, uh, about half of them living in their own home. So that's not necessarily where there's the, the major housing need. In private rental, quite a high proportion, 20%, almost equivalent to the percentage in the population. Uh, we do know uh, from different sources that at least a third of these, that's a very conservative estimate, at least a third of these 95,000 people nationally uh, are living in, in affordability stress and quite severe affordability stress. Uh, so significant housing issues there in terms of affordability and other issues I'll talk about. Social housing, about 60,000 people live in social housing. And this is where we'll find more affordable housing for people on low incomes. Uh, there's just not enough supply. There will be new supply coming on, but it's, it's tiny, it's a trickle compared to the, the numbers that we're talking about here. But I'll talk about some of the issues with social housing as a solution. At least 50,000 people who are adults, 25 to 64, still living with parents. Some of them are very happy to live with their parents getting full support, some of them really anxious to move out, and some of them will have to move out uh, over time at some point, it's inevitable, or not necessarily move out, uh, but find some housing and support solutions. And then we've got 50,000 people in nursing homes, boarding houses, aged care facilities, these are young people in aged care facilities, uh, really shocking numbers, and we add that to people in institutions still in 2016, still 5,000 people across Australia, and 5,000 people. That's, again, a very conservative figure for homelessness. We don't know because we don't know the general number of homeless people, but even to, within that, to drill into the number of people with a disability uh, is almost impossible. The data is just not there. So very conservatively, you see, if I, if I count the people who we think are in inappropriate housing here, it comes up to over 100,000 people. And... Um, these are the people we need to find solutions for across uh, those different uh, sectors and housing types and policy domains. Uh, I'll talk about a few issues to think about when you start to plan a big national housing plan for people with disability. One is transition planning. Uh, for those, I mentioned those 50,000 people living with their parents. They have support, they have housing. Um, some of them want to move out, some of them will have to move out. It takes time to plan that transition. If that transition happens without planning, people find themselves in very difficult situations, not necessarily the types of housing and support and family arrangements that they would like to have. Uh, but we do know that people who had, had good planning, uh, they had their own plans, not the NDIS plans, but their own plans that they worked on for a couple of years uh, very thoughtfully with enough support around them. They come to the NDIS and they, they can get the support they need. They might find housing situations that are more appropriate for them. So ensuring that there is a program out there, there is no program out there to support that planning. We've got a massive amount of people who need that sort of planning. There is no program to support it. And there are issues like emotional issues with families to deal with in terms of parents of people uh, really struggling to look at the future and for very good reasons. They, they don't really trust uh, the systems for good reasons. And um, 
they don't trust what other options are out there. And they're, they're pretty right. There are not many options in terms of housing. So uh, it's very scary to think ahead uh, for the sum of Dodo, where uh, for this is the landscape. So, so part of the solution would be around uh, planning, just to understand people's choices. I mentioned the private rental sector, you know, 95,000 people, let's say 100,000 people in private rental, at least a third of them in high affordability stress. In addition, we know physical accessibility in the private rental sector is shocking. There is no accessible supply. It's just very, very poor. There is no data, but we know from people we've interviewed, it's, it's very difficult, almost impossible to find accessible homes in private rental. We now have the changes to the National Construction Code, so that will create some additional supply of accessible homes. But first, not all the states have sort of signed up to it or accepted the, uh, the new uh, codes. And the second thing, it will take years, maybe a generation, for those new homes that are now being built to start to filter through to the people who need them. Uh, so we have a major issue in private rental that needs to be resolved. Uh, that's where we need to find some particular solutions, which uh, might be different and not necessarily means that all of these need to be moved to other housing and social housing, for example. There could be solutions within private rental, we need to improve the sector. And one of the issues we need to deal with is security of tenure, which is very poor in private rental. Um, then it need to be some protections. Share housing arrangements, there's been some interesting research done at UNSW. Uh, I was not part of that group, but I think it's really important to start thinking about share housing. And I'm not talking about group homes here. This is a very different story. This is about people who want to share, who uh, do it because of all sorts of reasons. They prefer to have social connections. They have prefer to have someone around them. They don't want to feel lonely. Some of them also want to share their supports, their informal supports, networks, and their uh, formal supports, like their NDS packages, and it could work well for them. Um, so sharing might be a solution, not for those 100,000 people I spoke to. It could be 5,000, it could be 10,000. We don't even know the numbers of people who would want to share. Now, the NDIS has data because they have plans for everyone, but then they were released even aggregate information about housing aspirations of people. So uh, it would be nice to actually know what is the number of people who would like to share and start to build some programs around that to enable sharing that's voluntary. It's not never forced on someone. It's uh, optional for people who want it. Uh, and then there needs to be some planning to enable that people can choose who they share with, where they live, and um, yeah, choice and control effectively. Social housing, this is, uh, in some ways it's, it's really appropriate housing because it's, it's secure compared to private rental, it's affordable, and you shouldn't be paying more than 25% of your income on, on rent in social housing. Uh, so it does provide some solution for people, particularly on low income. And if they have their support that's funded by the NDIS, they have this, our support workers coming to system, they can live wherever they want, and social housing might be a good opportunity there. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, we don't have a lot of social housing in Australia. It's about 4.5% of the total housing stock. Uh, when you compare that to a few countries in, in Europe, like England and the Netherlands and Germany, very poor uh, situation, a very marginalized uh, sector. Um, but we do have, uh, federal government and state governments now a bit more, I guess, uh, sympathetic to building new supply of social housing. So there is an opportunity uh, to provide some housing solutions to that sector. I don't think social housing is doing very well in terms of being a very inclusive environment for people with disabilities. If you look at the um, satisfaction surveys that they publish every, every year, uh, people with disability in social housing rate their satisfaction level about 10% uh, below. So 10% fewer people who have a disability uh, are dissatisfied with their housing situation in social housing. Uh, so it's not 
really it's never, despite the fact that about a third of households in social housing have a person with disability, despite that, they've never really adjusted uh, the way they provide services, tenancy management, and the design of the houses themselves and their maintenance to actually accommodate um, the people they house. Um, so there needs to be a lot of work in improving uh, the way social housing works. Um, social housing in Australia, whether it's government, uh, the state government, public housing authorities, or whether it's NGOs and the community housing uh, sector, it's a very paternalistic system. And uh, without romanticizing the NDIS, the NDIS comes with a sort of inbuilt choice and control agenda that's sort of central to how the NDIS was set up. I'm not saying that they've successfully achieved these aspirations, but it's at least it's an aspiration. And in social housing, you don't have that at all. There is no choice and control for tenants in social housing. If you're lucky enough to be offered a placement, uh, which you have to be in very um, severe circumstances to get that, uh, it's take it or leave it. You can't choose who you live with, where you live. It's very um, top down, dictated. So I think moving closer to the uh, choice and control model of the NDIS, I think is necessary if we really want social housing to be an appropriate solution. And it has to be. Uh, we do need that affordability level. There's been a very strong push from advocacy organizations to separate housing and support. Uh, so support services should not be the landlords. And there's a good reason for that because that creates a conflict of interest. It also meant in, in, in historically that if you had your home and your support was uh, provided by the same organization, if you're not happy with your support, you have to move out of your home, uh, which is, um, yeah, it's very disempowering. And uh, that created very unequal relationships between people with disability and their support workers and the organizations. Uh, so with the NDIS, there was quite a big push to separate those things that housing would provide by specialist housing organizations like community housing and support would be provided by uh, service providers. Uh, the issue is that then those support providers and the housing providers sign agreements like nomination agreements, uh, which end up kind of linking those things back together. And um, I think that's part of the, the problem that needs to be solved here. How do we uh, meaningfully separate housing and support? But also maintaining some level of coordination because the other side of the coin is that uh, you have separate, you have housing providers over there, the support providers over there, they're not talking to each other. They all think it's the other person or the other organization's responsibility to provide support for the person who just wants to fill in a form uh, and no one helps. And so, so there's a real problem in terms of, we need to separate the things, but they need to work together and they need to share responsibility uh, for support. And again, to counter this really paternalistic top-down approach and to move, not just to choice and control at the individual level, but to, to really think co-design and co-production of social housing, uh, we need people with disability on housing governance, on social housing boards, uh, really directing those organizations. There's some models in, in, in Europe again where this is happening, where tenants are empowered to be on the boards of community housing providers or housing associations. We don't have that in Australia. Uh, we, again, it's, it's a very paternalistic historical uh, approach to delivery of social housing. So I think. This is a really important area to provide voice and choice for tenants. Uh, there's some really uh, difficult issues here in terms of uh, people with cognitive disability uh, to participate on those types of boards, of management uh, boards. They need to be supported to do so. You can't just put someone there and expect them to be able to meaningfully participate and co-design the delivery of a very complex system. Uh, so there needs to be programs in place to provide support for decision-making, supported decision-making for people, not just in their everyday lives, but also for their involvement in governance. And this is my almost final slide. Uh, to think about homelessness, I mentioned 
a figure which is you know very conservative of 5,000 people with a disability, severe and profound disability in, in homelessness uh, across Australia. Uh, Ray and I have been in part of, part of a, pro a project led by RMIT uh, that looked at homelessness, a uh, particular model for homelessness services. So it's a um, common ground model. It's based on housing first uh, conception of homelessness services. Housing first idea is that, I guess in traditional homelessness services, the idea was you have to fix all your problems, fix your disability, fix your psychosocial uh, disability, fix your, uh, I guess, substance abuse issues, and then you will find housing for you. The housing first approach says, uh, now we actually start with the housing, and then you can start providing support for people, uh, but they need to be to have a home to even be able to access those supports. Uh, so that's a really good, I, I really agree with this particular uh, approach to delivering housing. Uh, but Ray and I, we did this research in, in the common ground model. And I think coming from disability studies, the thing that immediately starts strikes you. In homelessness, this is considered this kind of innovative model of providing homes to people, moving them out of the streets, out of homelessness into secure housing. But if you have some background in, in the history of disability, you go into this building and you think, wow, we're back to institutions. This is an institution. And uh, it's a very... It feels like an institution, it looks like an institution, it operates like an institution. Uh, we don't think there's a very good understanding of disability as a concept of disability support as a, as a practice in homelessness services. They don't even know how many of the people have disabilities. Uh, they don't understand how to assess or to even ask about support needs. Uh, they're very... These are very difficult places. They do uh, reduce homelessness to very important, uh, but they're also really hard places. So one of the, I don't know what was your experience right but it was one of the hardest places that I sort of visited as a researcher. So uh, I think we need to, there's another system that's forgotten that is part of the housing system that needs to be fixed to be more inclusive. Uh, so next slide, please. There's a huge gap between uh, Indigenous people and uh, non-Indigenous people in terms of access to the NDIS, in terms of access to housing. Uh, on both there, there's disadvantage on both sides of the equation. Uh, serious inequities in the way if you look at the NDIS reports on how funding was allocated and you just look geographically, you can see people living in remote places are significantly disadvantaged for all kinds of reasons. Um, scarce housing options, scarce support options, a lot of overcrowding, uh, poorly maintained housing, very culturally inappropriate as well. So this is another part of the story that has to be front and center. And uh, last slide. Special disability accommodation is an opportunity here for people uh, to access homes. It's a very small, this is what, when people talk about housing in the NDIS, this is the first thing people think about, but really it's a tiny percentage, it's 6% of NDIS participants. It's, it's a much smaller percent of all people with disability in Australia who will access uh, specialist disability accommodation. Uh, I don't think it's the NDIS has been very successful in setting up its pricing models and everything to make sure that actually uh, there is uh, actually delivery of SDAs. It's they're very falling very much behind in actually delivering what they've promised. Uh, and uh, yeah, that should be part of the story. Last slide. So just to say overall, there are supply issues in terms of numbers. There are huge numbers. We This is the, the big issue, but uh, it's not the only issue. We actually need to deliver housing that, that meets the needs, that is culturally appropriate, that is inclusive, uh, that people feel a sense of home in. Uh, there's a lot of issues. There's not one solution, but there's a puzzle. And I think it's just kind of finding those different pieces of the puzzle and putting it together. Uh, and it's, it's the starting point for a national housing plan. Yep, thank you. Fantastic presentations. And I think both of the presentations have highlighted it's important for architects and planners to understand the history of disability to know why the situation is still so bad. 
accessibility. And so, you know, disability and accessibility has a history of institutionalization, meant that people with neurodiversity and physical disabilities were pushed out of society and put into institutions, which meant none of the housing got built for people with disabilities and none of the built environment got built for people with disabilities because everyone just thought, oh, disability is something over there, away from society, it's something I don't think about, and here's the mainstream society. And it wasn't until those things like the social model came into place in the sort of you know, 1990s, and that's really late, 1990, we're talking about, you know, the inclusion of people with disability in society only being thought about in Australia in the 80s and 90s, like how late a timeline do I think? Um, the other thing I want to sort of mention is when you talk about the specialised disability accommodation, which was used to be called the group home, it was the solution to, oh, hang on, we have to close institutions down. We realise they're really exclusionary for people with disability. What we're going to do is we're going to close institutions down, build a home, which is called a group home, plonk five or six people with, a, people with a disability into this home with no choice of who they live with, and a house manager and a whole range of staff that they don't get choice of either. And then the architects are sort of going to come along, design these houses and try and build them for this generic mass of people with a disability. So it doesn't matter whether they've got a physical disability or you know, cognitive impairment or neurodiversity, somehow this house has to fit all that need into the one design element. Obviously you need accessibility and bathrooms and things, you know, they're standard, but things like neurodiversity, had you just plonked someone with a neurodiverse condition and they had to deal with all of the other residents in the house who they might not know or get along or understand and the whole lot of staff who they don't get along or understand and the built environment is like too bright or too noisy because of all of these people and all of the things going on around them. So it's, you know, you've got the condition of disability, but you also got, you know, the, the living environment of what we're expecting people with a disability to live in and that's something architects have to sort of think about. So the other models are like what Elan was talking about, we have shared housing ideas and they're much better, you know, models to think about because at least the individual with disability gets a choice of who they're living with. They get a choice of the built environment that they want to move into. And there's also other ones coming online which are called supported independent living. Again, where the individual takes their support and leaves it out in a unit and the support comes to the house and they have sort of relative to choice, control and independence about their living situation because the supports are coming into their home. I'm glad you mentioned Berkeley. So for anyone that wants to know about disability history, Berkeley, uh, UCLA, or University of California, Berkeley, that was where the independent living model started. So when you think about all of the community-based supports we have around the NDIS, i.e. support workers going to the home, that's where it started. It was those students that came to the university, but then they said, well, hang on, we don't want to go back to the institution. We want to live in a house. But how do we do that? Oh, we need some support workers to come in and help us. So the attending care model started from Berkeley. So it's a point of reference. That's how that all started. But um, yeah, so accessible housing, we've got you know, the mainstream design standards and living guidelines are coming online. My just final point of that was, you know, it's so, again, so late in coming online. If we had done those standards, you know, living, what are they called, living guidelines, or not housing guidelines, in the National Construction Code, yeah, little more housing designs. They're coming online this year, 2022, 2023, if they come online. If they had been done in sort of like 2010, we would already have 12 years of all of that housing built, development and building would have been built to accessible design. We would have gone a long way to improving the stock of accessible housing by now. But now they're sort of still in there or we're thinking about it mode. So and it's also an issue now for aged care. We want to reduce fall risks. We want people living in the home and aging in place as long as they can. So we need accessible housing in the mainstream stock for people to be able to um, live safely and live in their own homes for longer. So there's my rant. Accessible <laughs> 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 housing, have you got a question? Yeah, so we have one online um, participant yep. question. So I'll read it out. Comment with relation to housing. Is it more likely that housing stock is reduced in regional and remote areas? And with that, there may need for people to move away from community and connections in larger centers or cities, which can impact on people with relation to family, friends, work, and connection to community culture. Oh, it's, it's a comment. Yeah. Um, I mean, is anyone wanting to expand on that or comment on that comment? I know this is um, one of the, when we're working with Kieran Ari, that, that was one of the issues that, um, that they wanted to talk about people returning to country. 
and and creating housing. And Andrew and I just looked at each other and went, "Oh, let's just start here, <laughs> and then we will we will we will move to that to that point." Um, it is, I guess, it also depends on the providers as well because as you were saying, you know, it's we're relying on a lot of um, private housing for this. So it's um, there are people who are doing it, but it's it's still you know, in its early stages. So. Thanks. Question here. Yeah. Hello. Thank you so much, Kirsten and Anna, for um, both brilliant talks. Um, question. I just had something popped into my head when you were talking about um, <clears throat> the tools for communication that the students needed to present certain sorts of drawings and plans and things in order to. Pass, I guess, mm -hmm. because essentially there were certain requirements at university mm -hmm. to show that they had <clears throat> the necessary develop the necessary skills over the semester, but what they actually needed to present um, for uh, the participant juror of the campus blind um, was actually quite different. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting. Um, point because sort of in my my experience working with a lot of clients. Um, not only are architectural drawings inaccessible to someone who can't see them, even um, to anyone who doesn't know how to read an architectural plan or section, like they're quite abstract. It's a skill to learn how to read those drawings. And so they're quite inaccessible to a lot of people. And I, I just wonder, um, uh, you know, what your view might be kind of moving forward how assessments could potentially change to, to you know balance developing necessary documentation skills that we require to uh, you know communicate with builders and the like with yeah. rivers versus communicating yeah you know, you're actually delivering the needs of your client or people who are occupying your building using the building yeah I think with a lot of the documentation that students produce for Particularly for thesis, um, I mean, there's there's a demonstration of architectural skills, um, but I think there's also a style that many students take on, which is still sort of nice and polite and very small lettering, and you just sort of want to go, no, <laughs> you don't. Know, so on one hand, there's a there's a demonstration of skills. Um, there's also um, that human scale. I think is often disregarded when it comes particularly when it comes to moderation processes because it's not a museum or a train station or it's it's the day-to-day -day life and so it's it's not it's not as it's not as glamorous and as sexy so it's you know it, it depends on yeah so on one hand um you know we, we have the, we have the um the communication instruments that we need to say, well, you know, yes, I can do this architectural work. Um, but then on the other hand, it's okay, so but also how am I communicating to people? And so I think it's um with, with the studio and moving forward, I think there's also things that Andrew and I are learning about how we <laughs> present that information not only to our students but also to our colleagues. Mm -hmm. And so there's a better understanding and appreciation of what we're doing because I think we're still grappling with um a lot of the complexity ourselves and so it's it's how do we then communicate the importance of that particularly as this is now a competency that we have to work with um and our, yeah our reviewer number two was just the, the classic it was just like but this is important it's like you know you live with it honey and see how you go <laughs> That's often a new thing for many people like yeah. many people just not experience disability they don't know somebody with a disability and they they hit this new world so, you know, uh, uh, ramps and gradients and level entry. And what do you mean by inclusion? And it's yeah. just a new for a lot of people. It's still still something coming on board with mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. One question there. Um, just following on from Eugene's comment, I think that you know modern technology can be harnessed because, as Kirsten and Andrew did for the studio, they used the university's facilities to print out tactile plans. So you know. The, and so we are three or four more metres high. And that's what I took to um, Wodonga and Cheryl was able to use that to feel where the rooms were. And so thinking about that, instead of just having the model 
in the computer, the 3D model of the computer, it can actually be printed out as a proper 3D model and sliced or made bigger or smaller or whatever. And so I think that the communication in, has to move more towards that tactile possibility mm -hmm. and not just something that's mediated by a computer screen. Mm -hmm. yeah. I took you yeah. Yeah, no, that was great because that will really help us with next year and producing further um, iterations of it. Yeah, My question is to Ella. It was such a wonderful presentation. So much awareness of the housing status of disability, housing status in Australia, or maybe medical. Uh, but my question of query is like recently I have been looking at the real estate ads and looking at different houses and they have started to advertise NDS compliant house and the rates go up and similarly in the rental section it's NDI is compliant and the rates are pretty high what could be the reason for that because it just like shows that providing for disabled is very very expensive yeah it's uh, interesting I'm surprised to hear that um and, and yeah, I, I um, yeah, I'm just gonna say I'm surprised to hear what you just said. It's really interesting. Uh, I mean, the, the private rental sector has not been responsive to any, you know, design recommendations before because there were no standards. Uh, now that there are standards, uh, again, that will come to new housing coming on board. I'm surprised that it was NDIS compliant. I don't know. Yeah. I think something is true. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what I don't even know what it means to be NDIS compliant because the NDIS has all sorts of different, uh, I guess, uh, design standards for SDA, but that's very specific. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll have to look into it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And why not? Why wouldn't it just be accessibility or something yeah. more, you know, 90% yeah. accessibility? And, and we probably need to be having across the board for private rental. You know, a little icon that says on each rental property, you know, this one has got level entry, this has got bathrooms, you know, so that you can just start jumping on those mainstream real estate sites and yeah. find a accommodation that's accessible. But it's a really good point. What they mean by those high on what that's going to be. They don't seem to have any surging like that we or rental. Like an accessibility so built up. Yeah. And weirdly enough, even though I don't like this company, you've used the recently. My mum has a disability and was travelling with her, and so having her accessible bath and shower is really important for her. Yeah. Um, Airbnb happened, mm -hmm. so that you can toggle that and really easily filter out the apartments that are going to be a problem for them. Yeah. Um, I've never seen that in a room. Yeah, that's a good one. Airbnb. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. ah. I mean, they might they might want to sell it to SDA providers, and and that's yeah. Yeah. that could be the reason. And then and then it, uh, there is this profit for the providers, the investors, uh, to uh, from getting the NDI, NDIS SDA subsidy. Uh, but that's never what how it was meant to happen. <laughs> that wasn't really yeah. Yeah. If you uh, rent out an NDIS um, compliant house, you get an out to five thousand dollars a year, which is technically more than you would get. Wow, yes. So that's how to take each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would like to add to each of the same thing. I'm also in similar stuff. They have been quite a 
momentum going on to say like NDIS, inert NDIS, SDAs, and all those stuff. And I think since I'm assuming they're lying or whatever, they might be in this problem. Sometimes they can kind of lie the reality, create the agents and all that. Yeah, like they say, four bedroom out there, three plus one study. And it's a problem, let's say the price, like a part of price as a compliance uh, associating or compliance, just kind of word gimmicks, just to attract and say, like, there's a private fund. This is an NDIS. It's like the market is in search to the greenhouse disability. That's probably the reality of the NDIS, but I think we've got to be careful. We don't let the market just go crazy. You know, there needs to be controls on it. There needs to be purposeful you know, housing being used by the market, which is this, you know, yeah. develop this dialogue just to make cash cow you know, investments and things. So I think that. NDIS needs to be very aware of how that money is being used. Thank you. That's been a great session. Thank you, speakers. Fantastic. So um, we move on to our next session, which is. Um, Welcoming the, our keynote speaker. So I'm. I have the honor to welcome Michael Walker. Sure I'm in the right position. Um, so Michael Walker leads the Victorian government's Victorian Health Building Authority in the introduction of universal design principles. And I know we had a you know maybe a conversation around this point earlier in the day. So it would be great to continue these discussions after Michael's presentation. And Michael, he is an advocate for embedding the principles of universal design in relevant government policy and across projects relating to the environment, physical and programmatic. Michael has provided input into policy and projects ranging from health infrastructure, aquatic centers, place spaces, and multi-sensory environments to significant state and national level projects such as the Melbourne Park redevelopment, skilled stadium, and nature hospital redevelopments. Michael ensures that method of practice is adopted by VHPA and is recognized that the creation of social and economic value by connecting people in the environment is more efficiently and effectively achieved using universal design principles. He is a tri triple Par Paralympian in wheelchair basketball. He will join us um, via Zoom. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, I think I need to share. I need to. Yep. Um, please wait for a while because you're not. You're not on the screen, but you're on my screen. <laughs> I'm not sure. I need to share my screen. Can you see that now? Not, not yet. Have we got lift off, ladies and gentlemen? We can hear you. We're just working on the RBA. Yeah, it's up on our screen. I'm not sure how to activate. Are you on share screen? Um, if I should. Where's his help? Oh. So, we just need to help You might have to uh, run it from uh, there because uh, can you get it? Yes. I think um, it's. Oh, this is not Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 
Okay, you can go ahead now, Michael. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I work, which is the Tangaran people, and pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging. Yeah. Okay, I'll just give a, a bit of background on myself. Um, as someone who uh, is visually impaired can't see me, um, I'm a Caucasian male. Uh, lack of hair on top of my head, but a lot of hair around my face. Um, chronologically gifted, that means I'm in my uh, nearly 70. Um, and also, um, my background in um, this area starts way back because I've been uh, in a chair for 45 years. Um, so it gives me a very strong connection to the lived experience, but also what I believe that there's been a, a void going for. Um, I was one of the first access consultants in um, Australia back in the 90s, and that's the response to uh, the DDA and also the premises standards. Uh, I've travelled through a, a number of different areas, such as local government, into government, and also where I sit now. Um, one of the things that I first found when I was an access consultant was the lack of knowledge uh, in regards to people with disabilities, but just generally the diverse nature that we were um, and the lack of um, uh, understanding of how the design matters in people's uh, lives. So um, I started uh, using the principles and I was lucky enough to actually uh, to meet uh, Ronald Mace before he passed away in the early 90s when I was playing basketball in America. And I was lucky enough to uh, speak to him because he was the, the founder or the godfather of universal design principles. And he was a man who had a um, had polio and used a, a wheelchair and he used these principles because he, he felt that there was a, a lack of understanding of how to design for the whole um, diverse nature of um, uh, the community. And the other thing that uh, I was lucky enough to do was to, uh, to visit uh, Ed Roberts's um, Berkeley Independence Living Centre, and Ed Roberts was uh, one of the first, uh, he, he contracted polio when he was 14 and he wanted to go to university, he had high needs. And it was interesting how he started his journey, uh, him and some of his friends and him to get to the university, because this was 1968, and this is not far away in, in regards to um, uh, the history of uh, uh, where we've been. Um, there was no pram ramps or curb ramps. And that was the same in Australia. So he actually got some of his friends to actually cut the footpath to create the first um, curb ramps to access Berkeley. So that was just an interesting little design phase that uh, was never considered as someone who was uh, getting around in a um, mobile, uh, in a wheelchair or a motorised wheelchair. And it's interesting that it was only up into the late 70s in Melbourne for instance, they were starting to look at curb ramps as an option for people to move around. So it's really interesting and it's not that far away, but uh, I thought I'd just sort of give you a bit of a background on that. Um, so let's, let's talk about what is ableism. And I think that's very important because a number of the um, uh, speakers we had today sort of touched on it briefly. Um, and I would like to just sort of talk to that, but also talk about human rights and design and what is universal design and accessible design and outcomes and conclusions. But first of all, I had to, I had to get a sense of how could I change something that wasn't really right. So I, I sort of created a, um, uh, a model that was sort of like the Trojan horse model where I got into government, then I can start uh, penetrating thinking and changing people's um, thinking in regards to uh, not just accessible design, but the principles of universal design. Um, and that was, it was very important because there needed to be a paradigm shift um, and particular that in, in government, there was more of a paradigm paralysis going on. So that's where I started my journey in Sport and Rec, which I was fortunate enough to influence them to um, start using the principles of universal design in their design and through procurement and tendering process and then changing places. I brought that in Maroondah City Council into, into Australia and it 
raise the issues of what uh, minimum requirements and standards are that really weren't fitting. And changing places was a very good example of um, um, universal design in regards to trying to um, have people accessing and participating in the society. Um, but it was no mention in um, the standards. But fortunately enough, over a period of time, we've got changing places into some of the standards, but not all, at least if it's a start. So can you start the first slide, please? Thank you. Um, ableism is discrimination or prejudice towards people with disability. It can be uh, described as a systemic and impersonal, interpersonal inclusion and impression of people with disabilities. Ableism interacts with other forms of discrimination, such as gender inequality, racism, homophobic, biophobic, transphobic, and ageism. This creates a multiple and intersecting forms of systemic discrimination for Aborigine people, women, LGBTIQ plus people, multicultural people, older people, and younger I'm, people. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm not sure what happened. It, I mean, your presentation is still on my screen, but um, it's not showing on the screen. Um, okay, I'll just stop share and then reshare. Sorry about that. Yep. That's all right. It's, oh, okay, um, you could continue now, Michael. Sorry. Okay, about that. Next, that's all right. Next slide, please. Ableism exists across urban and regional planning, yet is largely unknown, untaught, and unchecked in planning education and practices. It's entrenched in urban policy, codes, transport systems and the designs of our streets and communities. Now, ableism is also rampant in planning and decision, design decisions. Time and time again, I've heard universal design omitted in provisions of social infrastructure due to budget shortfalls or due to inclus inclusivities being too hard. This inclusion by design, exclusion by design, socially created through our ableist frame of reference. Now that constantly came up, especially in um, the sport and rec area. So I was lucky enough to be being moved across into the Department of Health to deal with a lot of the issues that was happening in health infrastructure. Um, and that's where the Victorian Health Building Authority was set up. Um, so I managed to um, talk in regards that when we're looking at health infrastructure, we need to connect it with the Human Rights Charter because it is a human right for people to have health and be healthy and, and be participating in this. So that was one of my roles to go in there. But there's one thing that is very hard to do in government, and a lot of you people would understand that, is if you haven't got a policy or a charter or commitment to this process, it goes unnoticed and it becomes watered down and gets confused with a number of different outcomes that we're trying to do. So one of the first things that I did was to develop a policy and charter in regards to human rights and how we design. Next, next slide, please. So the Convention of Human Rights, person with the disability, which is mentioned several times today in the CRPD, defines universal design and the designs of products, environments, programs and services to be able to be used to the great extent by all people. Combining a human rights perspective and a perspective of sustainable development. Now, if you go into the actual uh, human rights charter, especially the um, uh, CRPD, You'll see in Article 2 and Article 4 that this is how it's described and that's how it should be used. So I use this instrument from a very high level to influence um, governments in regards to their roles and responsibility under the Charter. So that was one way of actually getting some skin in the game and starting to understand that you are responsible and 
this is the way that we should be doing design. Now, in health for structure, universal design means of creating spaces that are functional for everyone, but addresses physical, sensory, and cognitive needs. Now, it was really interesting listening to one of the last speakers about neo-diversity and um, also neo-divergent people. Now, that's a very good example, and I'll touch that on later in regards to standards. I've just finished in doing guidelines for um, emergency part, uh, emergency departments in regards to um, autism, but neo-divergent people. And, and what that was so important is a lot of the things that we were, took, or we were putting into the guidelines are not mentioned in any sort of standard. And it was really important that we need to have a better understanding of that environment, especially for the invisible disability that we're talking about. So I think that was really important and it was really uh, pleasurable to hear and refreshing to hear the approach about uh, the invisible disabilities that we're talking about. And, and when I talk about that heightened sen uh, sensory sensitivity, we need to be including the light, colour, patterns, sounds, smells, taste and touch. And that was very important in regards to um, uh, emergency departments because emergency departments anyway are, are busy, noisy, smelly, all those sort of things. But what we found, what I found, um, putting these guidelines together, by just trying to improve a, a particular situation for one person, benefit for many, and many of those traits that we and elements were using in the guidelines um, became very relevant for onset dementia, uh, mental health. So it was really important that we actually started bringing this in. So that's one of the things that drove the actual um, uh, policy and also the charter. Next slide, please. So, the Victorian Health Building Authority is based on a shared goal to encourage strong social cohesion. In an increasingly globalised world, both Victorian government and the Australian government face the same challenge. Empowerment of the elderly. We're an ageing population um, and we need to understand that. And I'm doing a lot of work in PS RACs, which is the aged care, and changing the guidelines and getting away from that institutionalised approach into design and more as residential and that's your home and how we do those sort of things. Uh, in, in increased employment, it was great to see the profiling of people with disabilities and employment, uh, long participation in work life, quality of health services and inclusion of neglectedly structured discriminated groups. Now this is when I bring this up, when I talk about universal design, universal design People with disabilities is the largest consideration, but not the only consideration in universal design. Next. So here, here are the principles, and, I, and I'm, I'm trying to keep this very, very high level. I don't want to get into the granular of um, uh, the principles and the 32 outcomes that comes with it. But I usually throw this at probably a lot of audience when I do presentations, is to keep it at a language that people can understand. And now the first principles talks about equitable use and primarily what I just say, it's, it, it's being fair. Um, and when I'm talking today, I'm talking about just infrastructure. I'm talking about the hard infrastructure, not the soft infrastructure because universal design goes in the programmatic and operational. But I'm just concentrating today on the infrastructure, the hard infrastructure and the next come uh, the rest will come later as we go forward in, in trying to deal and, un, and get an un, more uh, an understanding of the principles and don't get confused with interchangeable terms like universal access, accessible design. So I'll touch that, touch on that going forward. So the first principle we're talking about: a building should be fair and usable by anyone. It should not disadvantage stigmatised or privileged any group of users. Now, fundamentally, that's very easy to explain in the built environment because still under the national codes or not the, the building codes under the standards, you can still create a building uh, that's compliant um, where it has steps, but has ramps either side. Now that's compliant to the 
10cc, but it doesn't meet the first principles of universal design because someone like myself that uses the wheelchair has to go one way to get in the front entrance and someone who is can uh, is quite able body will go up the stairs. So fundamentally what that does through the design, it stigmatizes and separates people's ability to get around. Now it's not just someone with a disability either. It could be someone who is using a pram, for instance, or it could be someone that doesn't hasn't got the, the capacity to walk upstairs or someone that's visually impaired. So that's fundamentally the first principle, equitable use. Um, and that's primarily really the nub of a lot of this sort of stuff in regards to how we look at the diverse nature that we are. So we don't want to stigmatise and disadvantage people how they use that environment. And the second one's flexible in use to be included. Um, the building should be inclusive in that, and that's a, it's a, it's a non-negotiable. But accommodating not only a wide range of individual user prefer, preference, but also users very functional abilities and how they get around. Now, um, the next principle was simple and intuitive being smart, and which is a really interesting one because it was starting to do a lot, doing a lot of work on wayfinding and what wayfinding means. And it was interesting, there was a couple of um, uh, presenters talking about assistive technology and smartphones and stuff like that. And we're looking at a lot of that sort of stuff going forward. Um, so we need the building itself to be smart. The use of the building should be easy to understand regardless of the user experience, knowledge, language, skills, or concentration. And it's quite interesting, they use universal design principles as their first prototype of a smartphone or a mobile phone. Unfortunately, what happened there is that um, we created a, a mobile phone and that, uh, that created another impairment in itself because people have got two, um, caught up in using phones and didn't uh, weren't watching where they're going and all this sort of stuff so it's really interesting how that works from that point of view acceptable information you know the building should be independent it's communicating all necessary information effectively to, effectively for all users regardless of the ambient conditions or the users very cognitive or sensory abilities and that's very very important because in in the health sector for instance if you're going to hospital, you're anxious anyway, and all those sort of things are quite heightened. Um, but we just weren't talking about the actual patients. We were actually talking about visitors. We were talking um, about people working in there as staff and things like that. And the first thing that I um, raised when we were, uh, I was bringing this into the, the health sector is um, I said, who's the longest person that stays in hospital? Um, and a lot of the providers, you know, gave me answers of oh, blah, blah, blah. And actually, it was staff, and we weren't planning for staff. Um, so we needed to plan for staff and how they function in this in environment. Um, and, and I, the things that I use is desk space, which was mentioned earlier today, um, you know, dementia-friendly, creative um, uh, guidelines, all those sort of things, and we create our guidelines going forward based on um, uh, uh, universal design. But we use the standards as a minimum to start the process and then we work up. Tolerance of error is very important. The building should be safe to minimise hazards and adverse consequences of accidental and un unintentional actions by any of the users. Um, and it was interesting, I think, uh, when Marianne Jackson talked about the, the, the TGI, yes, they are um, a pain in the bum if you're in a wheelchair. Um, but the problem we, we have with, uh, with uh, a lot of that is when it's put in, in place, it has to be maintained. We have to have better contrasters when we're actually doing a lot of that visual uh, acuities uh, approaches. So it really is uh, important to get that right. Low physical effort, the building should be active. Everyone should be able to use the building efficiently, comfortably, and with minimum fatigue. Um, and because everyone gets around at a different pace, they understand that, um, uh, you know, just primarily opening doors 
um, you know, committing what sort of door mechanisms you're going to use, you know, all those sort of things. And size, space, and approach, um, and being comfortable. Buildings should be comfortable. It should be appropriate size, space, for approach, reach, manipulation, users regardless of user body's posture or mobility. So that, that are the, that are the seven principles. And I don't, as I said, I don't want to get into the um, granular how that works in regards to a number of the outcomes. But so that's how I framed it in the actual um, um, the policy, but also in that that one of the things that we found is government, especially the health sector in our area, we have to become better clients. And when we become better clients, our expectations are raised to get these sort of outcomes. But the problem that we're seeing is the understanding of the principles in this type of environment, the lack of knowledge, and it is principle based. It's not a tick box approach such as standards or minimum requirements, not a cookie cutter approach. It starts with conversation. It starts with minimum requirements and then build for that. And as I said, a lot of the issues that we're having in the health sector space are not mentioned in standards. Um, but we've come a long way, but we've got a lot more to go. Next slide, please. So the intent of the universal design concept is to simplify life for everyone by making the built environment more usable by more people. The universal design concept targets all people of all ages, sizes and abilities. The consideration of people with disabilities is central to the ambition of universal design and that's so important. And the approach that I took, and this was over many years to get it to where I've got it now, is to let people with disabilities become the enabler of change. Instead, in the past, it's been, oh, we're doing this for people with disabilities. Isn't that good? No, what I want to know is that we can make decisions, have that control and choice about what we're doing and how we use people with um, diverse abilities to co-create co-creation um, and also give them a sense that they have actually got a hand on the steering wheel of design. So it was very important and that was a very, very um, subtle way of changing people's understanding of universal design. And it was through lived experience, yes, but everyone will be impaired sometime in their life. We talk about three types of impairments. We have uh, the permanent impairment, like myself, who is disability, paraplegic. You have someone who could be um, uh, temporary impaired that could have a sports action or could be using um, crutches or could be uh, can't hear through a cold or something like that. And then you have a situational impairment, and that could be someone who's got an armful of books trying to get in the universal door, at the university's door. Um, and so there's a, you're impaired. So people are impaired, are going to be impaired throughout their life. So what we're trying to do is to make these environments more inclusive so they feel that they can still function and still participate. Uh, also should be seen in relation to the needs and wishes of the rest of the population, which I've just said, whether they are children, elderly, women, men, or people of different ethnic backgrounds and traditions. And we talk about cultural compatibility. And I mentioned uh, the Aborigine and Torres Strait Islands, which I'm doing some work in regards to design guidelines for that. Uh, so next slide, please. Universal design asks designers to rethink some fundamental formal architectural concepts to contemplate environmental equity for all kinds of users. Now, if you notice in my presentation, I'm talking about equity, not equality. They're very different, and that needs to be uh, understood. Equality, I use the term equality, everyone has a t shirt. Equity, the t shirt fits. What I mean by that, one size 
does not fit all. And to consider a very variety of ways of environments can be designed or adapted to accommodate people changing needs, such as those of Asian or people who don't speak the dominant language. So what I mean by that, there's a couple of principles there working away. Uh, we need to age in place, and that's why we're talking about the accessible housing. I'm talking about the new um, uh, NCC and livable housing standards coming in. Uh, I was involved in getting that into the standards, but uh, I was probably um, disappointed because I was trying to push from a government's point of view, which were from the Victorian government point, uh, point of view, is to look more at the adaptable housing standard, more in the livable housing standard. But at least we've got the um, a commitment going forward. So I suggest that will cause, uh, will create more conversation in regards to um, how do we uh, design houses uh, for ageing in place, but also for people with disabilities, but just generally um, sustainable housing going forward. So that that's really an interesting uh, conversation. I did a lot of uh, did a lot of research, uh, did a number of papers on accessible housing, um, and what I found it was that some of the volume builders were doing a lot of these sort of um, elements that are coming in with the new uh, NCC because they weren't coming from a socially based approach, they are coming from an economic point because that type of design was selling better, the, the wider doors, the open plan living, all those sort of things. So there, there is um, uh, a fair bit of work to be done in that space. And I think it that's one of the areas of ableism that really sits in the property council and those sort of things. And, that's one of the reasons that New South Wales will not go ahead because they think it's going to cost money. Um, we know we've looked at certain um, design from the get-go, a front-end model, how you design these houses. Um, and from the cost point of view, it was low cost, no cost. Um, and so it, it, it's a really interesting uh, space at the moment in regards to housing. Can I have the next slide, please? So let, let's talk about just talk about accessible design, which it's been spoken about a fair bit today, uh, and compared to the universal design principles. And I have to reinforce: universal design is principle based. Where accessible design is based on legislative requirement, focusing on eliminating discrimination, minimum compliance with accessibility regulations such as the BDA, NCC, and the standards. It doesn't guarantee good design and it benefits a limited group of people. Now, what I mean by that is, is you look at the standards from 1428 and go through all the different standards that are used, that is a minimum approach. Now, the problem we have with designing at this particular point, we have a lot of big builds, small builds or whatever, just meeting compliance and that's enough. But all the other areas that I've spoken about do not sit in these standards. The standards uh, need to move a lot quicker, but it's a very hard process. So what we're trying to do from, from the, um, the Victorian Health Building Authority under this policy and charter is to go well ahead and wrap this around a best practice so it encourages the standards to, to catch up to what people need and what sort of design should be happening. Next stage. So that, next slide. So that's very important because I, I understand people saying, how do we interpret the principles? Well, we've got a lot of work that we're doing behind this to in, encourage what universal design is about and the principles. But universal design is not a euthanism for accessibility standards. Universal design can be distinguished from meeting accessibility standards in a way that access features, features have been integrated in the overall design. If you've seen a perfect universally designed environment, you don't see those features. If you see a minimum compliant design, you'll see those features. Handrails all those ramps, all those sort of things. So we're trying to get away from having that sort of 
institutionalized approach to design. Now, the other things that I bring into my work is also the biophilic or centigenic approach to design too, and that's connection to nature and all those sort of things. So it's very important that a lot of those sort of things are still not mentioned in um, standards going forward. So this integration is important because it results in better design and avoids stigmatizing quality of accessible features that have been added on later in the design process or after it's completed as a modification. Uh, we have lessons learnt for under DDAs and, and discrimination, how they can, haven't even met minimum compliance and it's costing a lot of money. So my advice is that when I talk to a number of different um, uh, groups on this, it needs to be baked into the process, not bolted on. Next slide. So there was one with, with the... Um, uh, the policy and the charter under the uh, in the Victorian Health Building Authority. It said very specifically that these are the things that we not, uh, need to look at, and these are the outcomes that we should be trying to achieve going forward. Now, the policies it says that you need to use universal design and go well above minimum standards. You need to uh, create an awareness and understanding and knowledge of universal design, especially internally in the staff. But I said, if we're going to create ourselves to be better clients, we need the people in the, in the, in the industry to understand the principles of universal design and how that fits in when you're doing uh, design. Um, so we, I did another approach in regards to how you engage people, and that was through... Um, which I framed uh, equity through procurement. So any tenders or master plan that has the principles embedded in the process up to feasibility into schematics and detailed design, and they're evaluated to go through that whole process. But before they were engaged, um, the tender process, there was a slight change in the narrative that I put in there, and it wasn't the wording in the early days was to consider universal design principles in your approach to design. Now we've strengthened that and says you need to demonstrate the principles of universal design in your design. That was fundamentally different, so they had to respond to that. Now the things that we were finding is a lot of practitioners, a lot of architects were using the standards as universal design. Now you'll see the language is starting to change like universal access. Um, no, separate the two, as I just said, access in the industry is based on the minimum requirements, avoiding, legislation, uh, avoiding uh, discrimination based on DDA, and, and when even the DDA came in and the premises start, standards started enacting in design, we had this crazy situation where a policy became a toilet because they started calling it a DDA toilet or a DDA door. So I was always uh, very um, amused about that, thinking when's a toilet become a policy or legislation and, and how come a legislation becomes a toilet. So it's a knowledge of these principles not to start interchanging things and keep it very principle based and using the standards and other guidelines and other work that's been done to up the ante and meet the diverse needs that we are and who we are and so I decided the next step was we need to concentrate on outcomes. So when I have my project managers, and there's another area that they need to change in regards to their thinking of universal design. There's a lot of PMs are based on two, two, two fundamental points, and that's a sense of urgency and a power of habit. They need to change to understand it's not about value managing things out and bringing it up on the budget, 
they need to understand why I'm doing this and what are the outcomes we're pursuing. And that was the hardest work to do to convince secretaries and, and ministers that this is the approach that we need to do and these are the outcomes that we're seeking. The first was equity, universal design builds on the concept of accessible design, which I've said, going forward to meeting, uh, going further than meeting minimum legislative standards by accommodating not just people, some people, but all the people to the great extent possible all the time. Next slide, please. So that gets back to one of the other outcomes that we're talking about is respect. People are diverse and everyone has the same rights to access and participation in society. All people, regardless of, it, of ability, should have equal opportunities to, to take part in society. This should be taken into account by private and public identities which provide goods and services to the public. And the good part about this department adopting it, it's the first in Australia, by the way, gave an effect and enable me to go to the whole of government and say, this is the way you should be doing things. So through putting this policy and this charter in place and getting it supported and ticked off, now, only six months ago, we have a whole of government policy in the Victorian government that they have to use universal design under this framework and model in infrastructure going forward. That's all government departments, from transport right through to education, through to other authorities, that they need to have this approach going forward. Next slide, please. So participation is a re it was really, that was brought home in a number of the um, uh, presentations I thought for today. Universal design principles, in all future infrastructure program developments in Victoria reinforces social equity in the built environment. To achieve, to achieve participation and empowerment for all. Universal design fosters societal capacity to support the development of its members, as well as resources to support interaction. To achieve participation and empowerment, for all through universal design. Nick, next slide, please. Designs are sustainable and all users are acknowledged and recognise a range of human capabilities. Cross sectoral and interdisciplinary work to ensure the most environmental and economical sustainable solutions through universal design to ensure sustainable solutions through universal design. And when I talk about sustainability, I'm talking about the person, human-centered approach, that someone, for instance, in any environment, especially housing or whatever, if you change or you age, you should be able to stay in that spot or live in that area or that environment without any upgrade or adaptation to the, the environment. Well, what I mean by that is it's, it's like from 8 to 85 or 8 to 90 that you can stay there because the environment's been designed in a way where it does not change, you can change and still feel part of that um, of society and also where you live and where you participate. So sustainability should be looked at more of a human approach than other areas. And if you um, you go into the 17 sustainable development goals, universal design is very much part of that to get those outcomes that are looking for. Next slide, please. Responsibility, and this is one which is, is probably spends half of my time talking to other government departments, ministers, directors, or whatever, and, Secretary, to ensure that government takes responsibility and stimulate the development of universal design policies and strategies. Now, governments can't do all the heavy lifting. Uh, institutions need to do the heavy lifting. 
such as your faculty needs to say, where do we place um, universal design in the curriculum or in the pedagogues in regards to how we teach people going forward? Is it more than just an elective um, unit in architecture uh, or project management? So I, I think it's such an important uh, role for institutions such as yourselves, creating people that understand what we're trying to get, and what we're trying to seek in our outcomes. And I guess it's that knowledge and understanding of how these principles can be implemented to get these sort of outcomes. So universal design is an important strategy for all kinds of organisations striving to operate in a socially responsible manner. Next slide, please. To increase the understanding of the benefits of universal design within the population, diversity comprises acceptance and respect, and it means understanding and acknowledging that everyone is unique, and that is a beneficial for the development of humanity, to raise the importance of diversity in society through universal design. Next slide, please. Universal. Um, collaboration, universal design accounts for all the needs of intended users, encourage cross-sectorial interdisciplinary inter, uh, work, ensure that most environmental and economic solutions um, are found. It was really interesting when I got into the Department of uh, Human Services, and this was some time ago, and looked at the, the housing thing about a number of the uh, public housing and how the actual housings were, uh, weren't up to scratch in regards to um, accessibility. And they actually cost more money to actually upgrade um, these um, houses going forward, like billions, uh, millions of dollars. And it's really interesting if you looked at it and what, what we're trying to get into the NCC now, or we've got into it, you know, such as simple things as re uh, reinforced toilet walls um, into bathrooms. Now, just one little thing like that that was in the actual first part of the design would have saved a lot of money. Um, and, and I think uh, Ray said before about um, if we took this on back in when we were talking about in 2002 about housing and adaptable housing standards and these types of standards, we'll be well ahead of the, the, um, the game now in regards to uh, saving money and putting more money into uh, the social housing, but also the private sector. So I think users, and one of the things that keeps coming up today is how do we get people with disabilities involved in this or co-creation? Um, and that comes back, that secular thing we're talking about employment, but we're talking about education, all those sort of things are very, very important. So user representatives should be involved in planning, designing and evaluating ensure equitable usability and the solutions developed. You know, co how do you look at co-creation, co-design? How do we get people with um, diverse abilities involved? And I think that's so important to um, universal design because it demands the end users or the designers to talk to the diverse nature that we are. Next slide, please. So the final message that I'm really trying to get across today, and this, as I said, this is very high level because I spend a lot of my time at um, uh, design level, interpreting and how to get these um, outcomes to meet the principles. I suppose the final message is equal status, equal treatment, equal merit and notion, uh, notions central to universal design. Sympathise rather than stigmatise, and I won't mean that in a in a um, negative sense, I mean, you need to have that empathy and understand and sympathise of what it means rather than stigmatise. Consider users at the beginning of each project. Design applications after the fact are expensive and marginalising. Understand the extreme to innovate the mainstream and accommodate rather than discriminate and innovate rather than replicate. Now, just before I finish, I mentioned um, um, Aborigine and Torres Strait Islanders in regards to design guidelines. And that was so important because the, one, the first principles of universal design 
also talks about about identity and it talks about supporting the construction of positive self-image and social status of end users and what i mean by that is that we've really got an issue in regards to how people with aborigine torres strait islands are getting into the home because our environments are not understanding or connecting to nature and, heal and healing through nature and what are we primarily mean by that it's just simple things of having spaces in the right places so you can gather your spirits avoid an approach that you need to connect with people on their own land their own mob how that translates into art a biophilic approach use of uh, materials so that needs to be considered under the banner of universal design going forward so it's very very important and it's really interesting because i do a fair bit of work in this area uh, um aborigine and torres strait islands there is no word or language about disability because they see it just part of their um approach as people um but we should get back to being connected to their country and how that feels so it gives them a welcoming uh, space to go into especially in the health sector and we know that because a lot of people do not uh, go into the, the hospitals and emergency departments because they're based very much on um, risk averse and security and all those sort of things and it's the same with people with autism too that we need to make friendly and safe environments for people going into it so when you uh, solve for one you create it for many and benefit many so I think that's my message today. Um, so I think we've come a long way. This government is really committed to universal design principles, but bringing in all the, the factors that we've talked about today to get the best outcome. Um, so that's it for me today. And look, I'm really disappointed. I'm not down there personally <clears throat> um, doing these presentations because I, I, I tend to like doing it from a personal connective um, nature than through uh, the online approach. So that's, that's me for today. And I hope uh, you guys have got something out of this. Um, but I think what we're trying to do in government, and as I said, we're the only government in Australia doing this. Um, a lot of governments are trying to follow our suit. Um, We've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. But I think this is a great forum to start that discussion and talking about how you design and what design does to people. Thank you. Hi, Michael. Yes. Hey, you Hi. might have to you might have to interpret for me because. Okay, yeah. my name is Catherine and I am not part of the architecture community. I have a background as a health professional and worked in health policy in site, state and federal governments. My understanding and observation over sort of 40 years of personal experience, professional experience, and now looking at it from the point of view of advocating for my own um, time in life, and I love your phrase, um, but, uh, is it that we need to actually reframe this whole conversation to a point where you identified the three different types of disability and therefore disability is actually something that we all own at some point in our lives but equally in a conversation we had around age-friendly design it was also brought up that when we don't do this we discriminate against not only our future self potentially, but equally our friends. So if I want to go and visit someone, I'm able-bodied at this point, it's relatively easy for me to access my friends. Equally, it's not so easy necessarily for my friends to come and visit me, depending on what housing stock I have. And so I think one of the framings from a policy setting point of view that we need to actually start to do is, is rather than the othering, is the conversation actually timely now to start pointing it as the ageing population goes through and NIMBYism, et cetera, is part of that conversation? 
Is it now time and, and timely to repoint this to this is all of us and some of us? I, I, I think it's um, be beautifully summed up. I, I think we're in a point of um, at a particular space that we need to be seen collectively together to try and get these outcomes. Um, and disability is one of the can be one of the strongest um, enablers in, in, into that uh, discussion. And it's future proofing too, to be able to understand going forward. Now, what I mean by that, it would be better to be looking at diversity plans than just disability action plans. Governments, and this is the other thing that I'm fighting for internally, governments need to stop looking or stop funding on a silo basis, like Aborigine, Torres Strait Islands, women, people with disabilities. Now, it should be all part of the main, and we should be funding that way. Um, so it's important. And I, and I guess the, the strongest thing about this is that you're having discussions on NDIS about the control on choice. You're having discussions about um, the gender equity and how we do things. Um, we're talking about the LGBT plus community. They're all, they are structurally discriminated or stigmatised. So what the principles are trying to do and what I'm trying to do and get government to do is, which they are, is to say, we are diverse and this is the way we should plan. Um, so I think it's very timely that we talk in that very broad sense to get these outcomes but make people with disabilities as strong as enablers to get all the other people together to say, this is that the way we should design. Um, and look, there, there's some really interesting uh, movements going on. For instance, you look at uh, amenities, you know, it's a human rights to go to the toilet. Now what we're pushing and I'm pushing into our design is that you have an amenities based on male, female, accessible, general neutral and changing places. So some everyone has a choice. But if you go into the stands, it doesn't talk about general neutral, neutral toilets. It talks about male, female and accessible. And I think uh, there was um, someone said the other day is that when you have the standards, they have to be correctly implemented. So if you have new toilets or ambulatory toilets, you have to have the correct fixtures and fittings and where things are placed. But there's not enough emphasis on that going forward in regards to post-occupancy evaluations. Now, post-occupancy evaluation should be turned up on its head. Let's measure the building and how that affects people's health and well-being, not because it meets compliance, the air conditioning works, blah, blah, blah. So I think if this particular conversation we're having now is a call for action to say that we're all diverse and that's the way we should plan. Um, and I'm coming from someone with a disability because I've got a lived experience and I still keep getting discriminated against, separated, and it's 2022. And I've been doing this for 30 years. Thank you very much, Michael. And I think... Um... It's, it's really a good timing to then move on to the next session, which is our break. I think we need it after two hours. And yeah, so we would like to invite everyone. Um, oh, well, first, I'd like to um, give Michael a big hand of applause for the um, So I'm Imogen, thank you so much. Um, I um, yeah, totally agree with you that the universal design principles are really useful and um, important. But one of the issues that I had that I with them that I don't know how to tackle, and I wonder what your thoughts are on this, is um, I think they're 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 vague. It's important um, that they're not too prescriptive so that they can be inclusive. I think, but. For many architects who have no exposure to um, experiences of disability, understanding how to be equitable or how to what perceptible might mean, even though I know there's examples in the principles, that can be really hard. 
uh, like, yeah. you know, um, an example might be like creating a ramp that's wide enough that someone could go up in a wheelchair and have a friend walk beside them or that two people could walk side by side, signing to each other as they go up the ramp. Um, that's probably not going to occur to many architects because they don't know, they don't know what they don't know. Right. So, yeah. how do we tackle that? Well, <clears> I, I, I created one of the one of the largest uh, websites. It's called Design for Everyone. On eleven elements of um, uh, certain spaces in sport and rec and open open space. And it's based on the principles versus the technical approach. Like a ramp has got a certain gradient and certain width and certain yeah. things that need to occur. Um, and then we talk about universal design. Uh, for instance, what you, your question you spoke about, um, you posed to them that you need a ramp that uh, two people can pass that could be a mobility scooter versus a wheelchair. Um, or you have a set down spot where you can have a communication face to face because of that. You know, that's, um, and, and I, I designed, um, uh, 50 column street in regards to uh, based on that uh, death space approach where you actually got out of the corridor because there were set set places where you could talk and convene and yeah. conversation uh, instead of being in the in the hallway and what happened people got more more out of that because they had a general conversation um, you know and I used use the example uh, the west wing walk with me but if you walk and, you, and people want to interpret, you have to be face to face to do that. So that's a good example of the standards versus the principle. Um, and pathways, for instance, in the open space. If we are activating spaces um, in a lot of local councils, they might have a technical standard for a pathway being 2.5 metres. What universal design does, and this is how I framed it in the design guidelines, suggest it should be more than three metres because you're activating space so you're bringing a lot of other types of people from dog walkers, cyclists, mobility aids, all those sort of things. But there, there's the crunch that what, my, what the policy is saying is the minimum compliance to standards is not good enough. Yeah, totally. so that's why we have to go about yeah. it. Yeah. So, so when, when I'm dealing with architects and designing hospitals and stuff like that, I talk about the right spaces and the right places for circulation. Yeah. Talking about, okay, look, hospitals are, are primarily a, a wheeled environment um, yeah. because there's a lot of movement around there. And the pandemic, COVID brought this to the face that we need flexible spaces where hospitals can flex and do different things in certain modes. Um, and that gets back to ventilation, air conditioning, all those sort of things with universal design asked. Um, so that's how we need to get that into the thinking of uh, the faculty in architectural teaching. Yeah. Is these are the standards, but they take so long to respond to the needs. Yeah. Governments and other authorities need to be the ones to bring that design forward quicker. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed your talk. Thanks, Michael. I'll hand over to Nita. <laughs> so, Michael, this is Punita, and I have been watching your YouTube videos but i was really wanting to see you here but unfortunately again you are on a photo <laughs> in the video uh, but my question is you did mention in your presentation somewhere equity and not quality can you really enlighten us what do you really mean by this equity and not quality sorry what uh, what, what the... equity but equity. not a quality equity and not a all oh, right okay Equity versus equality, right? Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, quality, not quality. Okay, so that's my mistake. Yeah, we, 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 we talk about uh, a lot. When yes. they talk about uh, equality, they're talking about they should be, everyone should be involved. But what we talk about equity, 
what I mean by that is equality, everyone gets a T-shirt, equity, the T-shirt. Okay. And, so, and, and in this equity, is it the physical equity or the experiential equity? It's the whole, holistic everything. You did talk about respect, participation, sustainability, responsibility, awareness, collaboration as your outcomes. They are utopian or is there any proof that they have really worked? Is there any publication or results where we see that the universal design principles are really working? Oh, yes, it's, it, it's, there's um, a number of reports on that. Take, take for instance, the biophilic sonogenic approach that we're doing. In regards to that, we know that connection to nature, natural ventilation, light, all that improves people's uh, ability to recuperate, mm -hmm. keeps people out of the health, um, acute health setting. Um, but my yeah, question, a... I think what the question I'm trying to say is, is it just the intended hope of the universal design or do we really have a proof that it is working? Because yes, we're, we're, we're measuring as we go. As we yes, and then I mean with the universal design, but they are not satisfied. So, is there a way, measure, way to measure their satisfaction, their contentment? Yeah, we're, we're looking at that um, in in regards. So that's that's why I mentioned uh, post occupation um, evaluation is to concentrate on the experience of people yes. and does it change their lives? And how we're going about that is we're looking at how long they actually stay in hospital or what their experience is, is like um, and what's the carers or the staff feeling about their mental health and the environment and all that sort of stuff. And that's a lot of work we need to do going forward is actually look at that social approach, not just a tick box and a mechanical hard evidence. We need to find does this design change people's lives? And how do we measure that? Well, fundamentally, you need to have an approach where it engages in people that are using these environments and get their understanding, has that changed your life? Um, and in the sport and rec, if you get people to participate, and we know through participation, you get, you get that community connection, you get that health and well-being. So, you have to measure it over a period of time that this actually is working. And, and that's our next step. That is really our next step. There's two things that government needs to do, um, and that is to measure it from that social aspect and also to get an understanding of our role as a good client and what we're trying to achieve. Um, and that's, that's why I put the policy together, is to actually remind the politicians and remind the secretary that this is what we're trying to do and this is a high order that's driving us to do that. But no, no. if you, you want an inclusive society... I just, wanted, you need to sorry, I just wanted your tips because I am trying to make a model that can measure the outcomes. Yep. If there are some tips to provide, that'll be really good. And yeah, well, I'd love to sit. I'd love to sit down, down with you. It's, it's some stuff that you can use. There's, um, I've been doing some work over in uh, Italy too, um, and they're using that very social model of how to measure, and that's um, in, especially in the health sector, um, and that's, and I, I can pass that on through. Um, well, if you, you've got my details, maybe we can sit down and have a really good... Well, like I had put a post on LinkedIn and that was against the happiness of wheelchair users. And I did get a message from you. I was in India at that time. I All couldn't right. post with you. I sent you a message, but I think you haven't even read that LinkedIn messages, so... Oh, that's all right. That, and it, I tried right, to right. Write down my email and we'll start that way and then we can have a good discussion and I'll give you a framework that I'm looking at the best way to measure. It's michael.p. Yes. Dot. Yes. Walker. Yes. At health. 
www.vic.gov.au. And, and, and I can show you a couple of models that uh, we're working on and what's being done overseas. I think it will give you a better understanding how to measure things. Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks a lot. And thank you for your work. Brilliant. Thanks, mate. Brilliant. Welcome back to our last final session for the day. I hope you had a bit of a break, stretch, and maybe um, toilet break as well. So for our last session, um, we focus on transport infrastructure and services, um, who, uh, which have been persist persistently excluding um, mo some groups more than others. And this has generated further group mobility injustice with compounding uh, disadvantage, particularly to those with intersecting social identities. And I think Michael um, discussed this earlier. So from transport disadvantage to total ex exclusion. Um, yet our interest not, not, it lies not only in bringing these impacts to the fore, but more importantly, to broaden the conversation from distribution to procedural and recognition. And in short, we aim to shift the discourse from not just transport equity, as we have been discussing, but towards transport and mobility justice and what it would look like. And we argue that the pandemic has opened windows of opportunity for citizen collectives to emerge and thrive. And in this afternoon, we will be hearing from two um, researchers um, who have been doing a lot of work in this area. So we have Associate Professor Jason Thompson and um, Saman Akbarian. So Jason is um, holds a PhD in medicine, master in clinical psychology and bachelor of science with honors. Um, he is Associate Professor in Transport, Health, and Urban Design Research Lab at the Melbourne School of Design, where he focuses on, focuses on the translation of research into practice across the areas of transport, urban design, safety, public health, post-injury rehabilitation, public policy, and health system design. You're very busy. <laughs> uh, that's a, that's a... <laughs> And then our next speaker will be Saman Akbarian. Saman Akbarian was born in Iran. Um, he went to, on to complete a bachelor's degree in software engineering, a master's in e-commerce, and is now a fresh graduate of the University of Melbourne. So Saman will be um, sharing his lived experience um, as a person with disability and um, his master's of information technology specializing in human computer interaction uh, as well, and which makes him um, which positions him perfectly to develop that uh, a technological solution for people with disabilities. He is currently working as a project manager and UX specialist at Cultural Infusion. So first we'll hear from Jason. And I need to share your presentation, Jason. Great. Um, look, thanks so much, everyone. I'm going to put a timer on because I don't want to go over time. Um, Saman and I have already had a good discussion about um, computers and people um, and I am going to be sort of looking over my shoulder a little bit so I apologize for that um, uh, uh, we can uh, go through uh, just uh, to the bottom of this slide is fine yeah so just um, I mean uh, Dirley finally um, uh, gave me a bit of background my background is in I was originally trained as a clinical psychologist um, then I did a PhD in medicine, but I did my PhD in medicine um, when I was working at the Transport Accident Commission. So I was very interested in the way in which um, people um, recover from transport um, accidents or transport crashes, um, uh, depending on, on how um, strict you are about using the term accident. Um, and so we'll chat about, I'll chat about some of that research later on. Um, but uh, just as, as way of background, my, my the first the first fifteen years of my professional life, I only really got into research and academia when I was about forty, um, uh, and I'm forty eight now. But the first fifteen years of my professional life was really in um, disability service design, um, and uh, uh, and so I I suppose and we were at this little um, research or a little uh, not-for-profit down in Geelong where we we probably constructed some of the first individualised funding programs for, for people, which um, uh, is kind of the way in which things have gone now. So really innovative little um, uh, uh, 
a service down there. So that's kind of my background. I've always been in and around um, the idea of service design. How do we set up services so that they um, are, are designed and work for best for the people who um, are supposed to use them? And I suppose the conflict I want to chat a little bit about today um, and, and touch on is the difference between um, whether a service is actually working for someone and what the typical indicators of success uh, that we uh, or that bureaucracies sometimes put up as okay, well, these are the indicators of, of, of success and, um, and and that's it. So we can go forward. Thanks, Dirley. Yeah, so um, some of you would have heard of Goodhart's Law, which is when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Now, the question I suppose I'd like in the transport space is what is it what is a good measure of transport accessibility okay what is a good measure of transport accessibility and going forward early thank you is it the proportion of tram stops that are compliant with the um uh dsa pt or the disability sort of standards is that a good measure of of transport accessibility or is it the proportion of trams that are compliant, the DSAPT, is that a good measure of accessibility? You know, these are these are questions that at the moment, these are questions that are in legislation around, um, you know, stands that that um, uh, Victoria is or Victorian um, the tram network in Victoria is supposed to be working towards. And if we um, and that the expectation is that both of those measures will eventually combine. We both have both trams and we have tram stops, and these things will eventually combine um, to produce an accessible tram network. And at the moment, we know that that is, you know, we're, Victorians are sort of failing at that at the moment, or Victoria is failing at that at the moment. Only about 15% of services uh, at the moment um, have a um, uh, accessible uh, tram and um, tram stop at the same time. Um, and now all tram stops in Victoria are supposed to be compliant in around 22 days from now. So are we going to make that? No, we're not going to make that. Um, and um, all tram trams are expected to be compliant in about 10 years. Okay, so we've still got 10 years for, uh, for that. But a live issue at the moment and one that the Victorian government is um, seems to be sort of trying to tackle is at least the rolling stock, um, so the trams themselves. But there are, I suppose what I want to highlight is that there's, there's no, actually no compliance measures focused on the proportion of people with mobility restrictions who can use the network. And that is the whole point of the exercise. It's not about having trams accessible and having tram stops accessible. It's the meeting of these two things together so that people can use it. And um, I suppose I, I fail to see many indicators of success which are about, okay, is this thing, you know, is it, is it useful? Can people use the thing? You know, that's the thing that we need to need to focus on. So thanks, Dylan. Um, so, um, and the context for this is, the um, uh, um, Victorian government is going through a, uh, or has gone through a tender process where they're about to spend about $2 billion on new rolling stock in Victoria. And the, the tender itself is all about the tram design itself. It's not about the, um, uh, the interface between the trams and the tram stops. And in fact, there's a, a great demarcation, if you like, between the um, what's going on in the um, in the discussions about what the tram should look like and whether that has anything to do with the environment at all. And this is a, I suppose, a battle, if you like, that we've been trying to, um, or, or a, a push that we've been trying to make for the Department of Transport and the um, successful uh, bidders in the uh, rolling stock network to be able to, you know, start to think about um, and think about reasonably. Um, so, a couple, in order to pursue this um, or to get ahead of the game, if you like, um, we can go forward early. Um, along with um, people in Melbourne Disability Research Institute, um, that's okay, we can go forward, that's fine. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, well, Professor Bruce Bonner, Amy Campbell Message, and Associate Professor, uh, Professor Alan Wiesel, who I was here earlier, but I think has, has left. 
we um, uh, constructed a survey um, that we put out to um, people in the community to uh, ask them about um, what it was that they found um, uh, uh, difficult about or, or um, might see solutions to the existing tram network in Victoria. So I'm just going to run through some of those um, uh, results now. Thanks, Dylan. So who participated in the survey? We, we had about 80 people who responded to the survey. Um, about 60% said that they had a disability and um, uh, we had a, a, a roughly equal gender split. Um, and 96% of people with a disability um, said that they completed the survey on their own. Um, and um, we had a, kind of a, a standard sort of age group, that's fine, thanks Dirley. Um, most people who uh, respond to the survey said, uh, uh, said that they had a physical disability, um, but there was some um, obviously overlap between um, uh, disabilities that people had. Um, and the second was the uh, people saying they had a psychosocial disability, thanks to Ellie. Um, and we asked people in the last week how much they had used um, the tram network. And of course, that. Um, I might describe that, that's probably easier. Um, we asked people in the last week how much they'd used the um, tram network. Um, and there had been a bit of a dip, obviously, because a lot of people were working from home, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, um, most people sort of said that they had, uh, we, about 60% of people said that um, before COVID-19, they had used uh, the tram network um, uh, about once a week or more. Um, and But importantly, uh, um, you know, why do people want to use trams? Why do people with disabilities want to use trams? Give it a hint. Normal things, going to the shops, going to work, doing the normal things that everyone, you know, wants to do. Um, this is not, not, you know, there's nothing unusual about anything in here. Get to the shops, get to leisure places, get to work, all the, all the sorts of um, regular things that we might expect. Um, and, but of the people who didn't use trams, um, what was it that they said was the major issue for them? Um, number one, difficulty getting on or off trams, okay? So it's this interface between the tram and the, uh, and the, um, and the tram stop. Um, lots of people saying also there's no tram stop close to home. Um, and, um, and, but, but once people were sort of saying that they were on the trams, that was fine. It was really about the interface between the, um, uh, between the tram and the tram stop. And so tram access was really it. So then we asked people, well, what would make you use trams more often? And, it, and, and again, if it was easier getting on or off the tram or moving around the tram, I, I tend to use them more often. Um, if tram stops were safer, if it was easier to find a place to sit or stand in the tram, um, we're more likely uh, to, to use them. But the primary, primary access issues related to the link between the tram stops and the tram itself. Not just the tram, not just the tram stop, these two things coming together. And again, there's no measure of that in um, the current uh, current indicators of success. There was a, what we'd call a bimodal distribution of tram access um, for people, sort of saying that between um, some people live very close to tram stops um, and then a whole bunch of people living very far away from tram stops. This was slightly different for people with disabilities as it was for people who said that they didn't have disabilities. A lot more people who said that they did not have disabilities lived closer to a tram stop than, um, than people with disabilities. So that's that's a thing to consider as well. And I'm not, not sure that that is well considered within um, the department at the moment. Um, and the, the, the things that would cause people with disabilities or the people with, without disabilities said that they would would mean that they would access trams more was really around price. If they said it was cheaper, then they would do it. That was different for people with disabilities, which was really about um, access, not about price. Price wasn't price wasn't uh, was less of the issue. Um, we asked again, you know, um, what are the um, what are the difficulties that you have experienced um, trying to access the tram network in Victoria? The tram stop and the tram are on different levels. Okay, again, this interface. Hearing and understanding announcements on the tram, also a problem, and no place to sit or stand at the tram stop. Um, uh, so again, um, 
in this discussion that we're trying to have with uh, the, the tender or the successful tenderers of the rolling stock the, of, of the trams themselves, there is not, is not really an appreciation in um, any of that um, or that, that there should also be research around um, that which relates to the, to the interface between the tram and the tram stop. Um, that these things are, are treated separately when they should not be. Um, so the theme, uh, the message from all respondents as to what would, make, what would make better access is being able to access the trams from the tram stops. It seems silly that we have to keep repeating this, but this is, this is it. Points that we had from the um, from participants um, being unsure of which trams and stops had wheelchair access and when low floor trams will even with, um, would come or stop on super stops. Uh, there weren't enough new tram stops for people who use a wheelchair to get on or off the tram outside the CBD. So we know most of the, the um, raised platforms are in, in and around the CBD. Most people, you know, as we've sort of seen in the stats as well, most people uh, with mobility issues don't, do, don't live in the CBD. You can't use them when you have a, a kid with a disability in a wheelchair. No low floor trams going to the children's hospital. So the destinations are really important too. So the DOT as um, so have acknowledged that the, the strategic rollout of, of um, accessible trams and tram stops, you know, the, the question is, should it be random? Should it be along particular corridors? Should it be in particular spots? You know, it would make sense that you had um, healthcare, um, what, healthcare centres um, being, being early on in the rollout. Um, being a young person with disability and no one offering me a seat, feeling unsteady with mobility aids, no wheelchair access at my local tram stop. Um, and again, sometimes there's a gap between the trams and the platform. This makes me nervous stepping on or off the tram because of my impaired depth perception and, and vision. Facilitators of use that people said, knowing uh, if they knew that all the stops and the trams would be accessible um, rather than the current lucky dip situation, um, you know, and that's, that's what it is. I mean, who plans a trip saying, uh, you know, it might take me five minutes, it might take me 35 minutes. You know, it's just not a way that you can reasonably plan your life. We should not be requiring people to plan their lives like this. Um, all tram stops should be designed based on universal design principles. I think we heard a little bit of that in the earlier presentations. Um, uh, and all, all trams as low floor and accessible um, uh, trams and tram stops and visual as well as audio updates on arrivals more wheelchair accessible trams and trams and stops. I think you can see the theme here. So the, the summary, um, the survey demonstrated the main access or concern for people with disabilities both use and want to use trams is associated with the connection between the tram and the tram stop. Not just the tram, not just the tram stop, the, the match between these things. Once people are on board, issues appear to largely abate, but resolving the difficulties accessing suitable tram stops and having trams map match to the stops is paramount. So it's not just about the tram. Now, a controversial part solution I have here. Could we bring back conductors? Yes, please. I spoke to a couple of people in my team today who were in their 20s, you know, young people. They, they, I said conductors, they were like, they started talking about drivers. I said, no, 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 conductors. They're like, what's that? Yeah. Amazing. Um, so, um, in 20, uh, you know, you look into this, so conductors in 20, uh, there was a push to bring back conductors in by uh, the Greens in, in 2011. And I think they were sort of estimating that it would be about $10 million to bring back conductors and, and more recent estimates that are about $20 million. We're, we're about to spend $2 billion on new accessible trams, right? Um, and I'm not saying that conductors could solve all accessibility issues, but they could certainly solve a reasonable proportion of them, I, I would suggest. Um, and we've now moved, I mean, culturally, we've moved from tram conductors who were help, helpful and helping people and all that sort of stuff um, to ticket inspectors. It's a very different, you know, it's a, you know, you see ticket inspectors, you're scared. You know, it, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, um, a helpful kind of thing to see. So, uh, and there are people who are, Try to advocate for um, tram conductors, and so I am on the tram. Bring back the tram conductors 
um, <laughs> bandwidth because, and I'm not saying it's going to fix the issue between, you know, a really high tram and, a, and, a, and, and the ground or something like that, but for people with, you know, um, psychosocial issues, they, they just need a bit of a hand up here and there, they want more confidence, they want, they want some space, you know, this, this is something that, that seems like a no-brainer for um, accessibility for me. Anyway, so that's my tram spiel. Um, I've gone on for too long, um, so I'm going to stop here. Um, but I'm more than happy to talk about this afterwards if anyone wants to ask me about it, which is about the psychological barriers that prevent people from getting back onto the road transport system once they've had um, car crashes. And this is a totally under un, under um, underappreciated phenomenon, um, and is also a huge, um, uh, uh, hugely exclusionary um, for people. Given that we assume that everyone should just once their physical um, uh, uh, injuries have healed, they should just be able to get back in the car and get back on the road. Um, and so, this is a, a passion of mine. Uh, but I will. I've taken up too much time, so I'm going to hand over to Savannah. Thanks. Hello everyone. Today I'd like to introduce Inclusion Atlas. But before that, I'd like to explain a brief background about uh, accessibility in Iran and try to compare uh, Iran and Australia, most focusing on transportation and public transport. So, so as I said, I start with uh, a brief background. In Iran. Then I came to Australia in 2019. So I'm going to briefly explain my experience, the idea behind English Atlas, and after that, it's open for q and I'd like to uh, ask your, uh, answer your questions. So in Iran, people with disabilities are mostly ignored because uh, let's say there is not uh, proper education in high school or even elementary school regarding how we can deal with you know accessibility for people with disability. Because of that, when you would go to society, people treat you uh, in different ways. Some people respect you. Some people have no idea how they treat you, other people discriminated you. And the number of people with disabilities in Iran is around 9 million per population. So it's approximately 10% uh, or 11%. So what uh, I decided to use my crutches because if I, if I sat on Teacher, since there is no place I have to go in a university restaurant, I have uh, I ended up to sit on my home. You know, work from home, study from home, even invite my friends to home. So I would be ignored from society uh, because of the situation. So I decided to. You know, are struggling with crutches instead of sitting on the wheelchair. That was really difficult because I have to use maybe double time calorie to put all my weights on my shoulder, but it gives me some benefits. For instance, like I could go to university, I could work with other colleagues. Uh, in this photo, yeah. two of them is myself uh, living in city. The other two, uh, sorry, the other show, uh, show that they are issue with physical disabilities. It's other don't have a ramp, or if there is a ramp, it would be not proper. As you can see, somebody has to push this person from this round, so you cannot live by yourself. But you know, in every challenges, there are also opportunities. So I developed an idea 
what can we have an application on a smartphone? So I can review and rate different places based on those accessibility. But since I was so passionate to get a degree in Australia, temporarily I put that idea in, a, in that archive to focus on my second master's degree at the University of Melbourne. Next, please. I came to Australia in 2019. Uh, everything regarding accessibility get very better. Improvement was not compared to my hometown, but the, the foundation of problem was still there. Melbourne recently has been recognized as the most friendliest cities in the world. Also, it, it has been one of the most livable city in the world. But the problem regarding accessibility hasn't been eradicated yet. There are still rooms for improvement. So I'm going to focus on transportation because before us, many people uh, explained accommodation, the problem in the city. So I'm going to explain my lived experience in transportation. Also, I'd like to make some brief example of other aspect as well. Next, please. So there are some pros and cons regarding accessibilities. Train station are 100% accessible, but not inclusive. I explain in a later minutes what it means to be inclusive. So some videos are accessible, like for cinema, restaurant, universities. So there are some useful application like a stop cell solve. If there is a problem in this city, you can escalate that problem to city council, Melbourne mayor, or other, even parliament. And they cannot fix this uh, problem as soon as possible. So also, there are some funds. One of them is finding accessible accommodation literally is a disaster. Every time I'm about to finish my contract at my current location, I start a panic attack, literally, because there is not broad definition of accessibility. And every time I go to inspect different places, there's some sort of accessibility, but not, not all of them. So I have to inspect maybe 16 places, 70 places, until I find my appropriate accommodation. Not all trams are accessible. That's very disappointing point because there are some old fashioned trams, imagine Swanson Street. So why they still in operation? Because we can easily replace them with new one. Sometimes I have to wait for accessible tram, probably 20 minutes, 15 minutes. So that's not decent, let's say, because it's one time and it's getting wasted for a public transport. So finding accessible venues are not easy. If I want to catch up with my friends, I have to call them venue, the restaurant, said that, hey, are you accessible? Do you have ramp? Do you have toilet and so on? There is not a website that can check all of them and make sure. Google has some these features, but the problem with Google is it's from business owner side. So it's totally biased. If I have a restaurant and it's not accessible, I might put a live information to attract customers. That's not good. Let's say 
which, which can give the benefit of doubt to accuracy, but still there is no uh, dependency. Sometimes it's a accessible, we go there and it's not. The other thing is that the definition of accessibility is different from person to person. What is accessible to me, maybe it's not for other people. So we need a proper application that cover all those. This is how inclusion atlas come to life. Before I introduce the application, I have to go back to train station. I mentioned it's accessible, but it's not inclusive. Inclusive means that when I enter a place, I feel included. Whether it's a ramp, toilet, it's good, but it's just a facade. What if the staff is not considered? What if my order has been delayed? I'm not feeling included at that place. Train on, trains are not inclusive because I got separated from other people. I have to onboard from the front wagon. What if I like to travel along the way with a group of friends? I cannot sit with them. So this is how universal design matters, not accessible design. The train station has to be uh, changed so everyone feel included. I can get on board from anywhere in my life, not the just from wagon. That's it, this. This is a summary of English Atlas. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this summary because of, uh, because of time. Uh, so I skip this slide, but I show this website in action. Thanks. So user can find accessible spaces and review them. Inclusion Atlas has two sides. One of them are users, the other one is phenomenal. So if you have a restaurant, the chain, shopping center, you can register as a menu owner in the website and interact with users. Users also can find your places into this application. Next. <clears throat> this is the main page of the website. As you can see, all of the categories, you can go even gambling, biking, miscellaneous covers. So, so what about you lot like to do during the city or even outside the city? You can find different menus and it's switched from Google API. So you don't have to add it while you're from scratch. So if something is shown on Google Map, you can also find it on Inclusion Atlas and get different uh, inclusive features. Let's say on the search bar, I search University of Melbourne. Thanks. It goes to the page of University of Melbourne. Currently, it's the beta version. So the pictures you are seeing comes from Google API. But in the future, users can upload their own photos and it will be shown up there a small approval because we try to moderate all of the photos in, in terms of preventing vandalizing. So, so when you upload a photo, it comes to our side. Then we approve that photo, it, can, it goes live and you can see the accessible feature. Also, you can see the location on the map. I think this is the Elizabeth Murdoch facade because uh, I think 
you put them in your Wikipedia so I to get a screenshot of that place. So next, these are the inclusive features you can read. As you can see, some of them according to uh, physical disability, some of them are invisible, some of them has nothing to do with disability, like bio space, species, LGBT, QIA community. Because at future, we can involve all different communities, like cultural differences, religion differences. Because if we focus on accessibility, this problem not going to solve. Diversity and inclusion doesn't specify a single community. It goes together. So in the future, we can increase those features. For instance, if you are a Muslim, you can find halal option in that criteria and rate that halal option in the future. But since it's a prototype, we want to minimize the key features to get the feedback from users. Then based on the research and development, we can increase those features. You might ask, oh, this is too much. What if I don't want to rate all these things? I like to rate just a few of them. In the future, you can personalize your user experience. When you sign up, they ask you which community you like to see the features, not your uh, revealing your identity. We don't ask about your sensitive question. So if you are an advocate, if you are a LGBT community, Muslim or other, you can think, check different communities and it, it will be personalized based on your uh, preference in future. Next. The website is available at the moment. Inclusion at last start by you. You can check it right now on your smartphone. If you have an Android, you can install that prototype as well. And the good news is we submitted the Apple version last week. So if we cross, it will be published after Apple review the functionality in the next. Next. That's it. Thank you. So I give it to join. Thank you very much, and uh, Jason, for the very um, helpful, uh, um, you know, research that you're doing, and of course the, the product that you have developed um, as, as a result of your lived experience. Really great. Um, we're, we're now opening the floor to questions or comments. You said in the discussions with the public transport, but they still don't predict uh, the local transport transport. Um, so people that the board of a hundred trams that are not deviating by and spend eight million dollars a tram and then have to spend two million dollars on a super spot to make them deviate by and all the other they did that so they would keep certain members of the community quiet. All the other people that use it that can't use it the age. People on walkers, all of a sudden, they stop scar. So that's what the people do. They put a stop in and they take stop there. So a stop there would run into a person who is a walker. All of a sudden, 400 people are walking on the street. So they have to stop there. Yes, so that's what they do. Yeah. And they don't can't use it and they run into a charge because the tram system is in the inner city, it's all the city suburbs, people buy their houses. They expect the tram stop to stay there. The tram, they build their lives around the tram stop. Well, the tram stop goes, and then the lives are through. 
Oh, I don't have an answer for your question. Um, <laughs> um, well, I think the only, and I suppose this is the thing that we're trying to push for them. We're trying to, and, you know, Ray Lean was in, in, in meetings with us as well. And I think it's fair to say that it's about the way in which the bureaucracy makes artificial demarcations between functions and funding and tenders that have nothing to do with the way in which people live their lives, you know, and, and it's, uh, I suppose it's a, um, a an unfortunate and um, crazy way in which to organise things because it doesn't reflect the way in which people use the services. Um, and um, I think even at that, that meeting, like the trams, the tram builders were probably recognising it, recognising the problem more so than um, what I would say the DOT representatives to recognise it. Because that, the tram builders were sort of saying, oh, yeah, well, we've been asked to create a ramp, but that's going to have to fit with the tram stop. You know, um, so we are going to have to think about the tram stop. But in in the discussions up to that point, we had been very much steered away from thinking about, you know, like we were sort of saying, well, you're going to have to match. And it's like, oh, well, they're not going to be interested in that. They're only interested in the trams. They've been contracted to make the trams and anything outside of that they're not interested in. But even the tram builders were sort of saying, well, yeah, we're going to have to think about the tram stop. Because they put 80% of the trams. The hundred percent touch of the ground. They refuse to buy the last one. That's going to do the same again. This time, and the um, stupidity of it all is what they introduced as a superstar, so they could get the problem out the way. But they built uh, the they did the train the line from Belgian Street to Park Street zero and over four. They did it in West Bradley zero and over four. They did Green Prairie this year, zero and overall. They don't want to build that. They don't want to build it. The only answer is to get the boat on track. And the problem is, they don't want to do that. Yeah. And, and, and um, you know, so you've got DOT, then you've got those things, and then you've got councils too who don't want to take out, you know, parking spots as well, yeah. another issue. Um, now that's revenue. Like it's it's this clunky coming together, well, clunky not coming together of different um, you know priorities and. Yeah. That's it's, at, at the at the most recent conversation or one of the most recent conversations. Um, a representative was talking about issues with tram stops and that um, cars were, had been um, collecting, you know, had 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 struck struck people coming off of the of the um, tram stops. And I suppose the question we had was, you know, have you, you know, I'm sure that the Transport Accident Commission would be very interested in this. I mean, one person having a, a severe injury like that would probably pay, you know, the liability associated with that would probably pay for a few tram stops. And they were not in conversations with that arm of of, um, of the transport uh, sort of system as well. So it's it it I, I, I don't have a good answer to your question. The only thing I could say is that we're trying to do our best to remain in the conversation and um, get them to think about this. And tomorrow we expect um, to hear back from the tram manufacturers about which research projects or which research partnerships they um, want to um, pursue and hopefully they will um, it will uh, go some way towards the match between these two things. Six years ago, I spoke with the Spanish director, they were laughing because they said, no one else does. Next year is the next uh, transport war again before the transport is even in the end of the world. That's the thing you ask, if you look at the country, they say, what's going on? So, yes. Yeah, I think that's a really good uh, conversation that probably can take offline later on. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jason. I think there's another question from um, Catherine and Ray. Were you putting your hand up? I was. Okay, so. Uh, I just want to say thanks both for the presentations, Ray. 
Um, and I think it speaks to what Chanel was talking about, about the unplanned walk with spontaneity with disability. Like often when there's barriers like the trams and you don't know where the tram is going to end or there's a tram stop that I can get up at, at the other end, it reduces that spontaneity with disability. It's created that, that barrier of having, not having to, you know, uh, otherwise you've just got to plan your day to the end degree. I need to know which tram stop I can get off at. I need to know if the restaurant's accessible. I need to know if there's a toilet I can use in the middle of the day somewhere. Um, and I think that's what people don't appreciate around disability and accessibility. Like, that it just schedules your life and makes your life very much planned. It's just another externality barrier that people don't think about. Um, and I think your application is going to go a long way to you know improving that spontaneity. And suddenly I can just go, well, hang on, I feel like you know you know whichever ride right restaurant, <laughs> and having lunch there. Can I da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, put a little entry there, and I'm getting in there. You know, that's something that the wheelchair world and you know this place you haven't been able to do much before. So it's a you know, great innovation. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's a good point where, oh, just to add to that, yeah. could include the grass as well. Grass. And there's really that disconnect between the supply side where Jason was talking about, you know, the tram, tram stops and, you know, the demand side where it really is a lived experience that's most important in this conversation, right? The design the supply side. Yeah, and thanks, Ray and Catherine. So I am saying on foot by choice, right? Or I'm saying on foot, kind of like the main concept is if you can understand that to be with a friend, to be with a walker, it would be in But the concept of being personally my father, right? That's okay. I think needs a lot of attention because we don't actually think about the as a model of transport that anyone knows. So the challenge is yes, I agree, the train stops have got so long that you've got to have a um, CO by background, you've got to have stamina to be able to move that distance, you actually your house is going to be close by, all those things. But beyond that, the thing that we all start with is some form of getting ourselves out of the house and to whatever formal transport might be. In my case, I choose my formal transport to be the shoes I wear. My question is, how do we keep those accessibilities continuous? We have an impact right now because a lobby group is rightfully from the climate point of view that it's only accessible to a certain number of people with electric charges now imploding on the um, footpath. We have micro mobility, which I have no problem with. I'm all for micro mobility. But the problem is the contestable space seems to be the space where it's actually imperative that it be clear. So it doesn't matter whether it's rubbish things, whether it's micro scooters, whether it's um, roadworks, whatever. The car is premium and that space has to stay. Public transport is secondary. And tertiary, way down the path, is getting from the home to whatever form of transport that you want to use. So I, and I know that it's not that simple, working government for the kids, and local government is obviously involved in that as well. But I think that's one of the hidden conversations that is actually across all generations, all accessibility, and it starts with, as I said, that coming out of your front door. So I'm, I'm not sure whose responsibility that is, whether the university is actually putting research programs and books there. I was in a program the next day today. Department of Transport didn't know the Department of, Department of Transport is doing that. They have a user design over there. How do we actually get this confluence? Yep. Um, uh, uh, we do do a fair bit of work around um, healthy urban environments. Um, so, uh, you know, places where you've got um, uh, reasonable density, you've got accessibility of services, you've got opportunities for physical activity and active transport. Um, so we do a fair bit of work around that sort of space. Just chatting with Saman earlier um, before the session about work that we're, we might be able to add um, or we might be able to compliment one another about um, not just places, but 
the places or the spaces between the places you know and what 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 is the surface like between this place and another one you know you don't want to you don't want to have to get in a car to go from one place to the other you want to be able to be spontaneous walk around whatever it is so we're all about i suppose uh um and i suppose i, I got into you know as a classic young boy loved cars you know all that sort of stuff and then I started researching, I'm like, oh my God, these things are disastrous. You know, a total disaster for everything. You know, um, cars, road injuries are the seventh leading cause of death and disability in the world. This is a machine that we created. We, we're obsessed with them. We, we, we put them everywhere. We build entire suburbs on the basis that everyone will drive. Um, and if you can't drive, then, well, there's no public transport. There's no other option to get around. Um, you know, this is, well, I suppose I'm, I'm agreeing with you. That's what I'd say. Please do something, sir. Also, the cars are important as well. People isn't getting the issues involved with the way the dollar market. Yes. Well, when you've got, well, was it 80, more cars in Australia than people, you know, there's a voting block that you can just go bank. Well, uh, what are you going to do? Are oh, we going to create a new road? Great. That that eighty something percent of people will agree. Sorry, so that one's fine. So I'm not sure who was first, John or. I really that question of the voting block of cars is really important because when we think about it, very often it isn't the number of the majority of people. It's what we hear on the radio. It's a car crash. So therefore, what we hear about is that commuters will be slower getting home, not that somebody's life's been destroyed. And that, it's really interesting to me when you're adding that people who used to be drivers who now can't as another part of that population. But I just wanted to introduce the work that I've been doing and to connect up with people here to try and find ways we can, we can go forward. I work as a public transport planner here in, <coughs> and a colleague of Jason's. And the work that we're doing is to, to try and recognise how do we make the bus system <laughs> more spontaneous. And the problem we have with doing that is that instead of having all our bus kilometres wandering the suburbs in ways that meet almost nobody's needs because our needs are structured around time and time of day and the services are spread so thin that they don't help us with that. But to counter that, we concentrated all our resources in the way many other cities do, putting arterial bus routes which are fast, frequently connected, is that we potentially lose the capillary, which is the bus close to where you live. But I think there's a, a real, we, we have to do the, the arterial bus route because that's how we get public transport universally in the suburbs. But what I'm really interested in working with people here is how do we make that capillary part of the public transport system instead of somebody needing to get an NDIS public transport or an NDIS connection, which, as I understand it, gives them almost no access and they're paying 100% for any other access. But for the rest of us, if we're on public transport, we're getting subsidised for 89% of that journey. So how do we spread that subsidy to create both capillaries and, and arterial? You know, people who understand a bit more about community transport and all of those things are be really, really keen to know about how we fit those two things together. Thanks, John. And maybe you have um, the last question and then go back to our um, speakers. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, it's been very interesting hearing all of these last few points of except being sort of crescendoing what I wanted to say, um, <laughs> which is that a lot of the ideas that have been brought up right now that solve the aspects of the accessibility and ultimately sort of mobility issues about how we moving around the city. We have a lot of static parts. We have uh, aspects like, you know, an arterial 
busways, but how do we get to the bus? We have information from some months app about the levels of accessibility throughout the city. We've heard about market mobilities. I think it's something that isn't yet to be tapped is uh, mass integration of all of these different systems through data. And um, you know, Samantha's app, I think, is actually just you know one step away from that. Like at the moment, we can look and see that this cafe has this accessibility, that there's this problem on the street. But uh, imagine you had an interface, and I'm sure it's something Samantha's working towards, much like Google Maps, you, you select the destination, and there's three different journeys. This one's this much time, this one's two minutes slower, that sort of thing. We can have the same networked, integrated response on something like Samantha's app saying, hey, if you wanted to go here, you could go this way, but because we have a mobility uh, disability, perhaps it's better to go this way where we've recorded smooth the surfaces. Perhaps instead of going the direct route to the shop, go a bit more left and you'll find that there's a transit stop that you can catch that will be you have to do a lot less time moving around to get there. Uh, this, we're one step away from this response. All it takes is to decide that uh, it takes just a lot of collaboration between obviously DOT, between uh, all of the, like, you know, NDIS thinkers and stuff like that. But all it is is just collaboration and data. Google Maps can do it, they're incentivized by billions of dollars. We just have to be incentivized by good, good ideas. Yeah. So, the actual, where I was going this morning, this fact I came from the Department of Transport and looking at inclusionary design in the department. Alongside, I'm actually going to ask them that the precinct along the Yarra, there's been a research project. Only in the last six months, where three people in wheelchairs for different reasons have matched exactly all of those things, and that data integration was part of that. It's actually about also knowing what is out there and who's doing what so that it ends up being collaborative and that these things are actually accessible in my tool. And we've just got Google in the last couple of weeks acknowledging that you can actually have. Accessibility and part of features. And it wasn't so long ago that I could map my journey from being to being walking to catch a bus, to catch a train or a train or whatever. So these things you're absolutely right are in the future. The issue for me is that we have to make sure that these wayfindings all come together and someone has to force this with all due respect to the individual doing this. From the yeah. Um, I think um, Mary Ann put her hand up first and then we'll give them the next yeah. ones. Um, Samara's work is to be absolutely applauded, yeah. and there is so much, there is a lot of similar work being done. But my problem with that work is that it's putting the onus on the individuals with disability to do the mapping, to do the work, to work out what's accessible and not what's not accessible. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to know what the existing conditions are. There's no doubt about that. I was saying that earlier today. But we must be very wary of not transferring the burden yeah, I agree. to people with disability. And we as designers and building environment practitioners must do better. Yeah. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, I just for a long to say, uh, Continuing to us about uh, the um, total search, something or that. But this, uh, this city, you are thinking about, have a lot of people in the medical global. They are still disability. You know, they, they are hurt, but they don't know how to do the global. Yes. And they also have all the people. They are still belong to this city. You know, I, I today I listened to all everybody in the uh, presentation. All right, I think it's great, but we too much, you know, uh, is uh, right, but too much is talking about the physical, uh, physical display. Yeah, and uh, we forgot uh, the world uh, have a lot of people, mental. They, 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 they might look disability. And they also, but all the people, they, they don't know. Yeah. If, if they don't know, 
So I feeling we need to think about the same um, um, and where. Yeah. That's all. Can I, you know? can I just comment on that? The, the second part, I've talked too long, but the second part of what I was going to talk about was about um, psychological trauma following road crashes. Yes. And how and how that cycle uh, and um, and uh, how that trauma excludes people from um, the transport system as well. So um, um, happy, I'm happy to chat to you about just the little that I know about that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, um, Jason. And someone, do you want to respond to so many things that was raised? Yes, I have a comment on Sami's idea about integration. You also develop a some sort of API for the future, not for recent use. So if this project becomes successful, we can brainstorm, send this API to other companies so they can have access to our data. For instance, if you have half a million users ratings, the other company can have access to this rating well, for instance, the direction, what you mentioned. Yeah. Can, can I just follow up with that too? What you're talking yeah. about is absolutely possible today. There's no barriers to it at all, except, and you know, we've got satellite imagery, we've got GIS, we've got open street maps, we've got all this, all that, but, but in our experience at the moment, everyone wants to own the IP. Yeah. And, and so there are barriers to all the sharing because someone ultimately wants to make money out of it. And that's the barrier at the moment. And I think that the sort of, you know, the tide's rising and, you know, like things that used to be quite expensive, like, you know, uh, are now sort of publicly accessible. And I, I sort of hope that it sort of ends up swamping all of this data and it does become democratized if you like and people can just bring it all together but what you're talking about is you know and, and i'm sure you probably know better than me it's absolutely possible now if people and even researchers i'll say this you know different universities are competing to do this because they want to develop up that method that you're talking about so that they can get more research grant funding as well you know are we interested in accessibility or are we interested in or and, and, and providing a benefit for the people that we're trying to provide a benefit for, or are we trying to get the next research grant? Um, well, you know, we're probably doing a bit of both, to be honest. And I think it's it's, it's a good time to um, move towards the end of the session, but this just goes to show the, you know, the emerging or the huge interest around this topic, and it means that there is a need to continue this conversation moving forward. Um, and on that, I'll move, uh, I'll call on Ray to um, do the closing. And before that, sorry, let's give Jason some a hand of applause. More than one in six Australians have a disability. More than one in six people who, are our, who share our homes and our workplaces, our streets and our cities, our lives and our hearts. They are our brothers and sisters, our parents and children, our colleagues and co-workers, our partners and friends. Our responsibility as governments, leaders, academics in this room and citizens is to build a society in which people with a disability can participate as equal members with equal opportunities to fulfil their potential. The success of the strategy will rest on a whole of community response, inclusive of business, the non-government and service sectors and individuals. Only by working together can we ensure all aspects of Australian life are inclusive and accessible. The strategy acknowledges and respects the diversity of people with a disability it recognises the importance of tailoring actions to take into account this diversity. Above all, the strategy is focused on interrelated outcome areas with tangible, achievable and priority policy priorities. Um, although aspirational, the strategy represents our national commitment to enabling every Australian to meet their potential, to achieve, to have a fair go and to have real choices to affirm the values of respect, inclusion and equality and espouse them as fundamental to our national identity. identity. Today, we have heard from many speakers, speakers working hard to achieve this vision of more inclusive, successful, accessible cities. People and researchers that have spent decades and careers working in this area and new early career researchers just beginning their disability journey. 
We've heard some great speakers about um, neurodiversity and new area of disability and architecture in the built environment. We've just heard about a fantastic, you know, tech app to help sort of navigate the accessible world or non-accessible world. We had some great speakers on what does it mean to have an accessible workplace? What does it mean for sensory disability like vision impairment and how do you navigate the world with a disability and a sensory impairment? So I'd like to thank all of the speakers today for their fantastic contribution. Um, most importantly, this day wouldn't have got off without Jasmine, who's had to leave, but you saw her running around early. She's done a mountain of work, as with Durley. Um, Peter over there and I have had lots of meetings. So I'd like to thank the School of Design at Melbourne University, um, the Melbourne Disability Institute and University of Melbourne for putting on this um, really important forum. I think he's just sparking discussion and getting things started. So I think you just have a round of applause, I think, for Jasmine who's done well. Um, I hope we are all able to build from our learnings today as the year winds up and when we move into planning for 2023. Let's hope that the discussion today has provided knowledge and insight into the importance of building inclusive and accessible cities and reducing ableism across Australia. Thank you. Did you want to say any final words, Peter? <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Huh. Um, I'll let you all go. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah. And I think we'll be back. Yeah. Week, if not much sooner. So yeah, we'll have another go. This is just the first mm. bit of our vision and what we will do. So thank you, everyone. Thanks.